I would like to call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, January 19th. We will rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Nick Burton Prately. We will remain standing for a moment of silent meditation in memory of those who have served <laughs> education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first item for the evening is a consideration uh, of the agenda. Are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda, Dr. Dance? Mr. Chair, members of the board, I would like to remove item H25 from tonight's agenda uh, for consideration. According to board policy 8314, a unanimous vote of the board is needed to change the agenda. All, of, all in favor of deleting contract number 25 from exhibit H, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Dance. I'm sorry. Hi, I didn't vote. <coughs> Aye. Sorry. Delayed. <laughs> Actually. Sorry. Thank you. All right. Uh, our next uh, item is selection of speakers for this evening. Sign up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this <laughs> evening's meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting to 10. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to discuss his or her issue. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in this box, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public por portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. first speaker is Bosch Ferron. The second speaker is Mina Jenkins. The third speaker is, that's not a speaker. Oh. Grocery list. A grocery list, yeah. <laughs> the third speaker is Marion Moore. The fourth speaker is Michael Parker. And the fifth and last speaker is David Green. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities we provide to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens and will take your comments into consideration, even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues <coughs> raised. When appropriate, we will refer your comments and concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would like to remind the public that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Beginning with this meeting, the public comment de ded dedicated to the second reading of policies will be prior to board member comments. I ask you to observe our timer, which will let you know when your time is up. And please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. I can stop that. All right. So at this time, we'll call up our um, advisory group representatives, and we'll begin by Mr. with Mr. Nick Burton Prately, who is uh, from the Baltimore County Student Council. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening. Nick. 
I hope everyone is having a uh, fantastic Tuesday. I know the students um, enjoyed their day off today. I know I did. Um, <laughs> as far as what uh, the students have been up to recently, um, back in December, we held our December General Assembly meeting, um, and it went very well. We heard from uh, the curriculum office about uh, the new grading policy, which students really enjoyed. I, I know they really enjoyed uh, giving their input on the uh, changes. We uh, had a very large turnout for this meeting, um, numbers that we haven't had in some time. So I think students are responding very well to the, uh, the changes in format as far as how the meeting is run. And I think they find it's a bit more productive and they have something to bring back to their school. So I think that's a, that's a big positive. Um, just coming up in about two weeks, uh, Deeksha and myself and a few other students will be attending uh, the LEAD conference in DC, um, which is a national conference and pulls uh, student leaders from around the world to attend, so we're very much looking forward to that. Uh, we'll also be presenting a workshop with a few other students, um, so we, we're very excited about that. Um, as far as what we're working on in the future, we are looking forward to March for our next General Assembly meeting. I'm trying to plan that out. It, take some time <laughs> and um, we're also uh, planning our advocacy day in Annapolis um, and we're going to talk about a few youth related bills that uh, that the legislators are are looking at thank you thank you our next speaker is from Tabco Miss Abby Baton Good evening. Good evening. Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. Um, you should have a paper in front of you that has kid care on it, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. With the first real signs of winter and a possible whopper of a storm upon us, I would like to take this time to remind everyone of our families and especially our, ch our students who are living in poverty and even worse, those who are homeless. These families are truly in crisis and barely have enough food or clothing when the weather is milder than, than what we are facing now. How can we expect these students to concentrate on school when they are daily in basic survival mode? We are only as strong as the weakest members of our society and it is up to us to help provide them with the necessities for their basic existence. Our staff members often provide food and other items for these students to help, but we can't really rely on our teachers to carry this burden themselves. That is why we at TAPCO in 1981 created Kid Care, a fund for students enrolled in Baltimore County Public Schools. Kid Care was formed specifically to help our neediest students. When lack of appropriate clothing and or supplies inhibits regular school attendance, we help provide those necessities. We rely on our school employees who are familiar with the, the case to provide necessary information to make a request. School counselors and social workers are often the individuals who provide us with the requests for these needy students. We in turn provide vouchers for those families to purchase clothing, school supplies and other necessities and we require receipts once the merchandise is purchased. Already this year we have distributed $12,560 to 314 students. Our account balance is at the lowest since 2007. We pride ourselves in that 100% of the money donated to Kid Care goes back out to our students and families in need. TABCO donates the administrative time to manage the fund and we hold fundraisers to help meet the demand throughout the year. We also rely on payroll deductions for, from our wonderful BCPS employees. So, you have a sheet in front of you. Anyone willing to donate to Kid Care, they do not have to be TABCO members, they can be anyone. Your donation is tax deductible, and I have included a form for each one of you. Please feel free to pass this information on to others. Our students are counting on us. <coughs> Thanks, and stay warm. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Ms. Megan Stewart Sickling. Sickling. I'm sorry, I pronounced your last name wrong. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. 
I don't want to take 15 seconds to say hi to everyone, so I'm just going to dive right in. I'm here to speak um, specifically about technology and the use of communication devices with nonverbal children um, or children with communication challenges, especially in the two to four year old range. Um, I wish I had more time to tell you about our success story, but it will have to be enough for now to say that at one point, my son was a two and a half year old nonverbal child with autism. He had very little ability to speak and was not responding to um, sign language or any of the other things he was being taught um, and developed some significant behaviors like beating his head against a wall or a chair because he was completely frustrated at not having a way to say something or ask for what he wanted. So it was really difficult for us as parents and through um, an opportunity outside of Baltimore County, we were able to get him trained on a voice output device. And it completely changed his life and ours. Within four months of getting that device, he had a working vocabulary of over 250 words and was regularly speaking in two and three word phrases and up to five word phrases and sentences. Uh, at that point, the county saw his success and did step in and then provide a communication device. Um, and we are grateful for that. Um, but I would like to look at that issue of initiative and where these ideas come from. Um, the great thing about the communication devices, especially for that age, is that you can continue to push cognitive and communication development, even if the child isn't speaking vocally. So they can answer questions, they can tell you what they know, they can learn to put words and phrases together. There is so much benefit to having this. Then if they speak vocally, they're already that much farther ahead and they haven't lost that time. If they don't speak vocally, then they're already that much more proficient with their communication device, and that is a wonderful thing. So what do we need to make this work? Obviously, we need a budget for communication devices, but it's not just enough to say we have to buy devices. There also has to be training for the people using them so they know how to identify children who can benefit and how to teach it to them so that they can be most successful. I cannot tell you how phenomenally frustrating it has been to walk into my son's elementary school and see kindergartners and first graders walking around with their devices simply because we think they should have them or we understand that technology is really helpful in education. I support all of those initiatives, but it is absurd to me at this point that we are having the level of conversation we're having about technology in this county and we are not having a serious enough conversation about its impact for children who can't even communicate without it and especially for our youngest children because those preschoolers and our two to three year olds are always the ones who are forgotten in the technology conversation so please begin to have that conversation about speech devices and especially for our youngest children thank you thank you thank you <clears throat> Our next uh, speaker is from the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education, Ms. Julie miller breitz Good evening, President McDaniels, board members, Dr. Dance, and the BCPS community. Happy New Year to everyone, or should I say joyous New Year, productive New Year, healthy new year. Clearly the sentiment is that I wish a positive new year to everyone, but how I choose to word the expression conveys slightly different nuances to the overall meaning. Semantics are important, and as the reworking of policy and rule 6401 gets tossed back and forth among the 6401 committee, the law office, and leadership teams, there are a few areas of wording that the GTCAC wants to be very clear on. When I moved to Maryland several years ago, I searched the term gifted and talented along with Baltimore County and Maryland. I was able to quickly find relevant information about state and local regulations about identification and services to the GT population and navigate to BCPS's gifted and talented webpage and read specifically about the GT program. Now BCPS has changed the name from gifted and talented to advanced academics, which is of course a nuanced change, one that is broader and more inclusive. We completely understand and sympathize with the aversion that some people have to the term gifted and talented. It can generate negative feelings, which we are not tone deaf to. 
However, whether you call a person gifted or academically advanced or any other derivation, that will not reduce the questioning about why someone else's child doesn't fit that description. Will there ever be a word for gifted that doesn't inspire accusations of elitism? What the term gifted and talented does have, however, is a history. It has been used for decades and is used and defined at the federal level and the state level. It is used across a wide variety of advocacy groups and in professional journals and is also still in use within BCPS as a course identifier at middle and high school levels. It gives parents a common search term across jurisdictions and helps to lay the fear that we continue to hear from parents that the GT program has disappeared in Baltimore County. Parents look right now to Policy and Rule 6401 for guidance, and no search of the internet for above grade level programming will bring up a wealth of information to do with what BCPS is now calling advanced academics, and neither will a search on the words advanced academics. The current vernacular, gifted and talented, will spring to mind in a quick Google search with the GT terminology returns loads of information that is both accessible to parents and which helps them partner with the school. It's for all these reasons that the GTCAC strongly advises that BCPS please Please call the policy and the rule and the BCPS office gifted and talented and advanced academics or GTAA for short. Another critical issue for the GTCAC is the need for an accountability piece to stay in policy 6401. It is essential that the school board require BCPS to annually submit a report about how GTAA services are working disaggregated by subgroups. Otherwise, how are stakeholders to know where the GTAA program is succeeding or falling short and how the district is measuring success or failure? For the assurance of the board, parents, and other stakeholders, there must be yearly reports that provide evidence that the GTAA program is being monitored and assessed. Board members change, BCPS staff change, but the policy remains as a governing document for the thousands of parents and students who live every single day with the results of what you, the board, set out for student education. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next item is uh, public comment speakers, and we'll begin with uh, Dr. Bosch Farone. Good evening to all. Good evening. Good evening. I'm glad I got my voice back. <laughs> Hopefully you hear me better. Today I finished continuous 11 years speaking to the Board of Education. I probably missed five because of emergencies in those 11 years. And I'm really not counting attending a calendar committee or some of the other things. And I did that, and I will do it for another 11 years, because I really believe in inclusion, in diversity, and equality. Um, a summer ago, I visited one of my patients in the Baltimore County Detention Center. And it was really cool down there. Actually, it was cold. They have very strong air conditioners. However, 33,000 of our students in Baltimore County Public Schools don't have air conditioners. As I spoke to you in the past, this is an issue of safety, especially for those who are disadvantaged. But really, if we talk about money also, closing the schools is really loss of opportunity to learn in. And the students who are really sweating because they have no air conditioners are not going to retain the information. The teachers are not going to be able to perform well. So if we really think of other institutions, I thought to bring to your attention that the Humvees that US <coughs> Army use have air conditioners. Many helicopters, Army helicopters, have air conditioners, even though when you go way high up, it's cooler up there. Um, GM doesn't make automobiles without air conditioners. Rhineland homes can't really sell homes if they have no air conditioners. And my past car, Versa, which is like a Pepsi can, is just a little bit bigger, has an air conditioner. Um, 33,000 students don't have air conditioners. So I call on you to really open your hearts and eyes. I know the issue is complex and political in a way, but these kids require AC by this springtime. And I really hope that you would 
really vote for that and take whichever action necessary to have a portable unit in every school classroom before the sweltering summer. Last but not least, I was going to say a few words about the contracts, but I don't have time. Maybe quickly, if you look at JMI 605-16, it's $41 million, and it's about really students' engagement and so forth. This is really important, but if the students are sweltering in the hot summer, 95 degrees, um, they're not going to retain information. All right, so we put money in these things and other contracts that I've seen, and the students are not going to benefit from it the way we want. Thank you. My apologies Thank for you. taking longer. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mina Jenkins. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Nina Jenkins. I am PTSA president at Randallstown High School. Um, we are ecstatic that one of the items on the board uh, dockets for tonight has to do with the renovation of our auditorium. And we greatly appreciate the efforts that have been put forth by the Board of Ed, um, members of Dr. Dance's cabinet, and elected officials to make that happen. So we greatly, greatly appreciate it. Um, even as we've made those headways, and we made great strides last year, especially with regards to our media center and getting antiquated equipment, computers removed from the library that had floppy disks in them. We've become aware that the issue is still not yet resolved. We have a challenge with our Digital Arts 1, Yearbook 1, 2, and 3 classes, which currently has 36 computers. 24 of those devices have been identified as, by BCPS as being antiquated but it has not yet been replaced. 12 of those devices are slightly newer, but they're hand-me-downs from another school. This class is required to run Adobe, the Adobe suite of products, which includes Illustrator, uh, Flash Builder, Audition, InDesign, Dreamweaver, just to name a few. I'm aware of this software because I know that we use it at work in order to create e-learning e solutions with video um, and audio components in it to create various media in order to provide online training. With this, it poses a challenge to me as a parent to understand that BCPS has made the software available, but the equipment is not adequate in order to support it. Where ideally within a classroom with <coughs> this type of technology, students should be able to build packages and publish them to HTML to be able to see how they work and then go back and be able to revise them. Unfortunately, because of the antiquated equipment, they're lucky if they can do this once, when in fact they should be able to do that at least seven times during the course of their classwork. And they are not able to do that. Again, not because of lack of interest or, or inability to do so, but really because of the lack of the resources in order to make that happen. It truly burdens my heart when I talk to the teachers and find out that they have to, in essence, dumb down the curriculum in order to find a way to establish a common ground for students that are on slightly newer devices and the antiquated devices to have somewhat of a level playing field. Um, for a school that supports a mass communications magnet that had, was recognized last year by Wall Book Yearbook for the achievement in what they did for the production of the yearbook, um, has been added to their photo gallery, has received acclaim around the city. It seems that we are not adequately supporting the efforts of those students. So I am here to appeal to you to consider um, providing upgraded memory in order to support well, one, new computers with upgraded memory in order to support the software that you've already spent millions of dollars to purchase. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. Good evening, education leaders. Good evening. What's a globally competitive student without a globally competitive job? My vision for education if given the equal opportunity to become the next superintendent, is the future careers of your students, teachers, and employees. Personal and professional development would be my mission. So let's discuss your current cha challenges along with some of my innovative and practical solutions. 
If we all review the budget, majority of the school system's funding is being requested from the federal, state, and local government. Now, what if we have a global financial crisis? and our national and local government cannot grant you all of the funds you request for the next four years. What would you do as the superintendent? Well, education leaders, here are some uh, things that I would do as your superintendent. In managing growth, I would create hourly positions hiring career coaches and mentors for middle and high school students. The career coaches would focus on personal and professional development. Facilitating real world uh, hands-on application projects that will create a time for academic teachers to focus on personalized planning for students. I would also develop a partnership with local colleges by promoting college students to minor in education. It would be my minor in education initiative to give college students a backup career plan after graduating and they could um, teach aspects of their major to younger students. Raising the bar and closing the gaps. I would uh, cut some of the instructional uh, material costs, uh, especially in the area of textbooks. Um, and, and certain supplies, I, I believe that that should be reducing over time because the more that you use technology and there's so many nonprofit and for-profit organizations that provide online resources that, have, that meet Common Core standards. And I've used them in the past um, teaching for seven years. And, it, and I, I rarely use my textbooks, honestly. Um, but when I did need to use it, I would. And I also have PDFs online as well. And investing in our future. We're now in year three of the STAT program, which includes around $14. million in additional resources. I'm still under, this, under uh, I'm not sure what I want to do with that yet <laughs> because I'm hearing other people talk about it. But here's one solution in closing. I, for the elementary school students, I would provide teachers with half of their class size, the, de the devices, so that uh, half of the students, once they've taken their pre-assessment, and maybe if they kind of understand the, the content, that they would get either get on the devices or the students that did not do well on the pre-assessment, they would get on the devices. And I would just kind of go back and forth with small groups and, um, and, and kind of separate the students because I noticed by te when I was teaching, there was three learning um, sections. Um, and I would kind of, you know, make adjustments based on, you know, what they were able to master or what they needed assistance with. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Michael Parker. Good evening. Good evening. I want to thank the boards for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight in support of the renewal for Dr. Dance's contract to continue as our superintendent. My name is Mike Parker, and I'm the current principal of Dundalk Elementary in the southeast area. I've worked for the Baltimore County Public School System for the past 26 years, and I've been an administrator for the last 14. Last week, I was unable to attend the board meeting but I was able to watch it via the BCPS web website and its live streaming. I watched and I listened to the many speakers, but I was inspired by our kids. Mm -hmm. Kids from all around the county, from all races, from all ethnic backgrounds, from different grade levels. They came to speak not only to, about the support of Dr. Dance, but also their feelings for him. I could list all the accomplishments BCPS has achieved under the leadership and support of Dr. Dance, from Blueprint 2.0, to STAT, to safe schools, to hiring more ESAW and special educators, to wireless devices, to equity. But that's not what I want to speak about tonight. Tonight I want to share with you what I've witnessed over the past three years that I've never seen in other leaders, his commitment to our kids. As you can imagine, there have been many discussions the past several months about the renewal of Dr. Dance's contract. The one thing that many of my colleagues have shared with me is that Dr. Dance's commitments to our kids. 
When Dr. Dance walks into a building, our students' faces light up. They actually know who he is, and they know he will take the time to listen to them. He has not only talked about giving students a voice in their education, he's making it happen. As with everything, there are things we need to improve upon. But the one thing Dr. Dance has brought to BCPS is that it is about the kids. He has taken what we all talk about and put it into practice. A wise old person once said to me, never say something a kid can say. This is what Dr. Dance is trying to accomplish as he moves us forward by having our students' voices heard. In closing, I'm proud to call Dr. Dance my superintendent and leader. I'm proud that he is passionate about our kids and he is given a voice no matter what age. I ask you to renew his contract to continue with the vision of truly listening to our kids and meeting them in their world instead of having them work out of ours. My father, Ed Parker, once asked me, Mike, is education an expense mm. or an investment? Dr. Dance, thanks for making an investment in our kids. Thank you, board. Thanks, Dr. Dance. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Green. I was glad to hear uh, last week uh, uh, Marisol um, talk about adaptation. I think it's very important. And uh, when 21st section, century technologists uh, talk about doing adaptation, one of the things, one of the tools they use is something called a retrospective. And what that is, it's a big word for a short meeting in which you go over some work that you just did and then you talk about how it went and uh, what went well and how you could change a few things to maybe make, make it go better in the future. So I'm going to do a little bit of a retrospective now and I picked uh, Marisol's um, speech that she gave last week. And so what you do is you have, you write down the events that, uh, that happened and you sort of have a timeline and you use colors to tell what your emotions were at the time and you go over that and you then have a discussion. So the first thing I observed is I have a yellow sticky and that, that stands for confused and cautious uh, feelings and Ms. Johnson announced, she, she was announced as a speaker to give public input and I kind of scratched my head and said, wait a minute, I thought she was supposed to be listening on the other side of the microphone. And uh, so it, it struck me as not appropriate and it kind of reminded me of a Sprint commercial where this executive type guy in a fancy suit and in, a, in an old, in a new, brand new office uh, talks about sticking it to the man. And the, his, he, his assistant turns to him and says, uh, excuse me, you are the man. And I, I'd suggest to Ms. Maris, uh, Ms. Uh, Johnson that, that basically you're the man now and it wasn't appropriate for you to be taking up a spot of public input. So that's one confusing thing. Another was uh, some people, you said some people don't understand the need for spending money today to invest in our students tomorrow. That didn't quite make sense to me. Then you get to a blue one, which is sad, mad, and bad. You said, you made some veiled references to uh, what I assume was uh, people from Hereford and you said they do not like the young black superintendent who is in a position of power to change this county. I, I'll just leave it at this. I didn't like that and it made me feel partly sad and partly mad. Then you said if I had a vote and I went again, you do have a vote. The people back here don't have a vote. Uh, so that puzzled me. Then you said, which I do, and you kind of, there was sort of a smirky smile on your face, which, again, a blue card, I, I didn't particularly like that. But when you're the man, uh, bragging about your power doesn't um, go over well. So you said to, that you wanted to keep the superintendent, I agree, I have a green card for that. Um, but I'm a little bit more worried. I, I'm not worried about Dr. Dance, I'm actually worried about the board and you in particular. 
and I think you need to do some adapting and I hope you do a little bit of a uh, retrospective with the board and try to consider how you need to ch change your behavior. Thank you. Our next uh, agenda item is new business, personnel matters, retirements and resignations, Dr. Mayo. Good evening, Chairman Daniels, Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Good evening. Why like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements and resignations. <coughs> Any questions for Dr. Mayo? If not, um, do I have a motion to approve exhibits F1 and F2? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Any abstentions? One abstention. Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Our next item is new business. Action taken in closed session. We'll call up Mr. Nussbaum. Good evening. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the Board of Education considered two appeals regarding confidential employee and student matters in your quasi-judicial capacity. Uh, both were considered on the record as no requests for oral arguments were made. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions that were taken in closed session in those matters which were hearing examiner number 15-27 and 16-31. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Second. It's been moved and second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Ms. Kazi abstains. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. And the Nussbaum. orders are on the table for signature. Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, next item is new business contract awards. Um, Mr. Gillis. Thank you. The uh, Building and Contracts Committee met earlier today and has <clears throat> recommended to the entire board approval of contracts H1 through H24 and H25 through H32. Not 26. Oh, 26. I was so close. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 1 through 32, except for 25. <laughs> okay, is there any discussion at this time? Okay, do I have a motion to approve uh, items H1 through H32 with the exception of 25? So moved. All in favor, please say... I'm sorry, I need to um, exclude one of them, 19, number 19. Okay. In the voting. Yes. Only because I'm going to abstain if you want to do them all together. Yeah, she, can, she just yeah. wants to abstain okay. from one. Yeah, that's fine. 19. 19. Okay. All those in favor of approving the contracts uh, presented, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And then we have uh, no opposed. Any abstentions other than Ms. Williams? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, item is new business, um, a work session on the FY17 operating budget. Uh, I'd like to call forth Mr. Saris, Mr. Tantliff, and Ms. Wynn to the table. Good evening. Good evening. Um, first, just want to introduce uh, the new budget staff with Tantliff to my right, who is the new director of budget and reporting, and Kelly Wynn, who is the new fiscal supervisor in the Office of Budget and Reporting. And uh, Witt is going to start with a brief summary of pages uh, one through three of the work session document and then we're gonna try and get right to your questions. All right. Thank you. Um, as Mr. Saris mentioned, I'll do a, a brief overview of the first uh, few pages. If you uh, start on page one, it shows a roll up of the various revenue sources that make up our 1.5 billion operating budget and 1.8 billion overall budget. Um, general funds are our most flexible revenues, and pays for most of our operating expenses, and mostly funded 
by the state and county, while special funds uh, refer to our major restricted grants such as Title I and IDEA. Um, the capital projects funds covers our um, capital needs, while the debt service fund is uh, shown here to reflect capital leases that are required to be in the board's financial statements, uh, but BCPS does not have any uh, authority to directly issue debt. That's always done through the county. The enterprise fund covers uh, all financial activities in our food service program. Um, and lastly, the internal service fund is relatively new and it covers our self-insured workers' compensation claims. On the bottom of the page, you can see our enrollment trends. Um, we're projecting to go up by uh, 1,225 students, or about 1% in September 2017, which is uh, fairly similar to the 1,142 that we <coughs> saw from FY15 to 16. On the second page, um, you can see a section by year on maintenance of effort. And this only refers to county funding. So maintenance of effort does not ever talk about our state funding requirements. Um, MOE is based on a per pupil amount. And from one year to the next, it can't be reduced. So as a baseline, if our students go up um, on a per pupil basis, the uh, maintenance of effort would uh, go up by a proportional amount. With permission from uh, the State Department of Education, there's certain one-time expenses, say a new software purchase, that we request to be excluded from maintenance of effort, um, and that helps encourage the county to, to be willing to spend more resources because it doesn't go into their baseline. They can spend it once and not have uh, be committed to um, always recurring that expense in the future. Uh, and lastly, you can see we've had a pretty wide variation of how much the county has funded above MOE over the years. Um, around uh, 11, 12, 13, when the recession was on, the county was funding right at MOE. This year, we're, requ we're requesting a 2.2%, uh, which is about $16.5 million above MOE. Um, and you can see below that the revenue mix, and it, it varies very widely by county uh, or Baltimore City, the mix between local funding and state funding. Uh, for us, we get 53.9% uh, of our funding from the county, 44.4% from the state, and a little under 2% uh, from other sources. And again, this isn't talking about grants, so it's tuition, interest and the local portion of uh, out-of-county living expenses for other jurisdictions that send their kids to school in Baltimore County. Um, and the last uh, piece I'll mention is on page three. You can see the breakdown of our expenses by the MSDE um, different categories. The, the Really, the couple things to note there are the majority of each category is salaries because 83% of our overall budget is salaries. And as you break down into the different pieces of the pie, it, it really ends up uh, being the same with the exception of uh, instructional textbooks and supply and other instructional costs. And the key, uh, the largest categories there, as you'd expect, the largest instructional, instructional salaries and wages are almost 35% of the budget, followed by fixed charges, which contains all of our fringe benefits. So they're all in one place, as, long, as well as the liability insurance. And the uh, third largest category is special education, which co of course covers uh, the services for our students with disabilities and is about 12% of the budget. With that, I'll turn it back over to George. And as he mentioned up front, he's gonna um, touch on a few the key financial initiatives and some of the issues you've raised and were raised at the public hearing last week. Thank you. Thanks, Whit. Just wanted to go over uh, the questions that we did receive in advance and that were raised at the public hearing. The um, question of converting curriculum to the digital platform on BCPS1 uh, was asked um, about, and I can direct you to page 212 of the budget document, which is where those dollars are located. And uh, let's see. So the uh, contracted salaries or contracted services line of 1,685 
$271 includes uh, amongst many other costs of, of maintaining the website. Um, professional development for STAT, which uh, you can see um, both in our work session document on page 12 is about $2.1 million. It is in the green line uh, in the bottom section of that chart. And in our budget document, it's in two places. Uh, it is on page 143 and is included um, in the uh, amount of instructional salaries and wages the uh, and the rem that's a million dollars of that total and about one the remaining 1.1 million dollars of that total is on page 233 and that's in a variety of categories here but the uh, largest portion of it would be contracted uh, services the uh, another the uh, the third question I received from the board was to verify that yes the chief academic officer is a member of the stat steering committee, and two questions that were raised at the public hearing uh, by my friend Pat Holt from Delaney High School, who astutely determined as a business uh, instructor that the administration uh, portion of the budget had gone up quite significantly by 13.9 percent. That is because administration includes technology and more importantly it includes some significant one-time items of about 4.4 million. So if you adjust for technology and one-times, the increase is closer to 3.4 percent. The other comment that Pat had was, well, why does instructional salaries only go up 2.1 percent? And the budget, of course, uh, accounts for a 3.9 percent uh, increase in salaries, but because instructional salaries contains the greatest number of positions, almost 9,000 teachers, there's a higher level of turnover and vacancies, and that's why we adjust it to anticipate those changes. And uh, I will just uh, then leave us to go forward from page five, or page four, which has all of the programs uh, that represent the incremental change or increase in this case in the budget. You'll see the bottom line, 59.448 million, uh, reflects the number on page one of at the very top line for general fund difference. So for that entire amount of the increase in the general fund, it, we have essentially itemized it for you on page four. And with that, we'll be happy to answer questions. Um, Ms. Johnson and then Mr. Call. Um, I'm not really sure how to go about this. Is, I'd like to put a motion to the floor. Is that appropriate now? Sure. sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would like to request a one-time um, $10 million addition to our budget. I'm not comfortable taking away from any of the students or the teachers or the any of the departments to fund the um, AC conversion that we need to have, the air conditioning conversion. Um, and I am confident the state government is going to um, do what they said they're going to do, all the advocacy that they've had, and funding our, uh, cooling our schools, as they call it. Um, so with this one-time $10 million budget uh, addition, requ uh, addition, I'm hopeful that we can provide an expeditious way of getting air conditioning in our school. So that's my motion. So just oh, for clarity. One this time, $10 million dollar addition to the budget. And who are we asking the, for the money, the state? Adding this to our, bu our, our budget one time. Of yeah, any increase to the overall budget doesn't necessarily have to be linked to uh, a revenue source, but in this case, the county would have to 
included in their request of any approved one-time items. Um, and I'm, okay. the reason I'm asking this is so we don't add something else and then, you know, add, take something away and then the county not fund that. So this is a one-time addition. We have a mo motion. We need a sec. Are you seconding? I'll, I'll second it. And, okay. And I'll comment on it. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there a discussion? Yes. Okay. Mr. Powell. Um, George. G George. Yes. Uh, so, so uh, Marisol's uh, motion um, is is something that is doable, in so far as we can make the request as a board. We don't have to, we don't have to say. Uh, we realize, of course, the county executive has right. to include it. The council has to approve it, and so forth and so on. But but that that's an that's an appropriate thing to do if the board chooses to do that. Is that right? Procedurally, right? it's Procedurally, fine. Procedurally, that's what yes. I wanted to make sure of. Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, <clears throat> I guess, Mr. Chairman, we're going to discuss this and vote on this motion prior to other questions. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Any I, other? I, I would just uh, I would just support Marisol's motion. Uh, I think it keeps. Uh, I think it's a, I think it's a powerful statement from the board about what how we feel about this issue, what we believe about this issue rather, and um, I would I would support uh, Marisol's motion. Any other discussion? I'm confused about what uh, is intended with it. Is that intended for either central AC or portable, or either? I'm not saying what it's for. I think that so it could be for anything. Yeah. So mm -hmm. AC in general. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I would want to know because you know, in light of the fact that um, there will be a vote on January 27th um, to potentially add portable units mm -hmm. as uh, something that you know that would be state funded. Um, I guess my first question would be to Dr. Dance if he's going to request that. At this point, I don't think I can speak on pending action that hasn't been taken just yet. Yeah, this, if this were included in the operating budget as a one-time item, it would not be part of the capital request that we have pending before the Board of Public Works. So it actually could not go towards Central AC? Yeah. Uh, no, not necessarily. But it wouldn't be uh, funded by, through the capital uh, allocation that is managed by the state. So it would be in the budget for one year for whatever, however we could all agree to, to use it. Okay, so it could be, okay. Yeah. Any other, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I had a yes. question for um, um, Marisol. Marisol, the $10 million figure, uh, how did you arrive at the $10 million sum? Well, some of the information that we were given as a board included a, a number around $10 million for needing for the, the portable unit, so I thought $10 million was a good was a good starting point. And um, just so that I'm, just so that all the board is clear, that $10 million would be what um, was presented to the board uh, as one way to air condition the remainder of those schools and those portions of schools which are not currently air conditioned. Is that correct? Yes. Well, I commend you, and I share with you this uh, thermometer that I've had posted for some time uh, at my workplace. So you can certainly, certainly, you can certainly ha add that to your collection, okay. and I certainly will be uh, voting with uh, um, the seconder of the motion on uh, on your motion. Thank you. All right. Any other comments, uh, if uh, Ms. Causey? Yes, I'd, I'd like to discuss it and then possibly amend uh, okay. amend the motion. Um, the uh, thank you, Marisol, for putting that forward. Um, the Department of General Services, um, under the auspices <coughs> of the IAC School Construction Committee, did the feasibility study <clears throat> and the costing that came up with the um, per classroom cost to provide window air conditioning units to those 
classrooms in Baltimore County Public Schools that do not have air conditioning. Um, and that number came up to um, 10,000 per classroom um, with 1,100 classrooms being identified in schools that are on this list that's been um, <coughs> presented to the board um, on multiple occasions. Um, so I would just, uh, I would suggest, and looking for discussion from the board, I would suggest that we amend your motion to say that we are asking for the $10 million to go to uh, provide immediate window air conditioning units based on the Anne Arundel County Public Schools model, um, with which our uh, COO is well aware of how that works, um, and the schools that are on this list. Would that, my fellow board members? I, well, Mr. Mr. Collins, uh, I, I would uh, think we don't want to do that, Kathleen. Um, I think it's a simple statement of the will of the board to keep the pressure on government, period. We're not saying which, which government, we're not right. saying how the county executive would find the money. We're not going anywhere near this dispute between the county executive and the governor over, over window air conditioners, or more precisely the comptroller, um, over window air conditioners or central air conditioners. We're just, Marisol's uh, uh, motion, which I was delighted to hear and was surprised by, as by uh, but happily surprised, um, it's just, a, it's just a declarative statement. It's a simple, clean statement by this board. And what it really is doing is reflecting what we have heard from our constituents of various sizes and shapes and descriptions and, and interests and locations and any other 10, 15 descriptive words you want to throw in about the issue of air conditioning. So I think at this point, to avoid specificity gives it more, um, more effectiveness than if we include a lot of specificity about it and if it looks like we're taking a side somewhere or another against in other kinds of, of disputes while you may be more precise and more accurate in, in your actual number um, I think uh, I think to 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 include this uh, makes a powerful statement and we um, stay away from or avoid getting into the middle of other kinds of, 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 <coughs> of, dis, of disputes. Um, and I think it would be better to, to just do it the way Marisol had suggested. Let me first say, I just want to say thank you to Kathleen Causey and for all the hard work that you've done um, and all the community members who've come out because that number and all the information that she's given, this wouldn't have been top of mind. Um, so I want to thank you for that. I would be fearful also getting too um, specific with the, the motion at this point. I think it's something that we probably need to discuss further as a board. I think that we are all probably, and not to speak for everybody, all on board with cooling our schools and getting air conditioning in our schools, whether it's portable units or not. Um, but I think, I agree, I think it would be a little bit too specific and, 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 and uh, we'd move, move too quickly if we voted for, on that specific amendment. Thank you. I second the amendment to the motion, and I think that it, it's actually, we'd be avoiding a political situation if we are specific, because it is only the county executive that has line item veto power. And so if we are specific about how we, we would like that money to be spent, um, I think we, we avoid getting into that entanglement except it's a stick in his eye. Right. Well, again, I think we've had um, some discussion. We've had a motion and a second. Um, I think the first thing we need to do is vote <laughs> on the amendment that Ms. Causey has put forth, and I'm going to ask for a roll call that uh, we go around uh, and ask uh, for a yay or nay on the amendment at this time. So, uh, Ms. Decker, would uh, you? Mr. Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Um, the number of votes needed will be six because Deeksha cannot vote. That's correct. Okay. Just want to be sure before we did this since this is a historic moment. Right. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I think I want to adapt my amendment before we vote on it. 
I mean, that would require another. Yeah. We have to, fir we have to first, first amendment. Uh, vote on the uh, amendment that's on the floor. Okay. No. <laughs> Mr. Collins? No. Ms. Eaton? No. Mr. Gillis? No. Ms. Johnson? No. Mr. McDaniels? No. Ms. Miller? No. Mr. Burke? Nay. Ms. Williams? No. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, so now we vote on the motion that's on the floor. Uh, Chair, I'd like to make another amendment. Well, I'd like to dis, dis, have another point of discussion. I think don't. I think we may need to vote on. Uh, okay. There we go. All right. Go ahead. Um, I appreciate your. I appreciate the comments about being too specific, um, but I do. But what I don't want to happen is we have ten million dollars that goes into the budget for air conditioning, and it only does two schools. So I think it might be um, appropriate to say something along these lines. I'm not making this actual amendment, but that we um, spend the 10 million on cooling schools that would not, on cooling classrooms that would not otherwise receive cooling before August of 2017. That sounds good. All right. Um, do I have a second of that motion? Second. All right. Any discussion on that motion? Now, um, I think I'm getting, I think I'm getting a little lost here. Maybe we better hear what the motion says. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let's ask Marisol to read the motion again and then see where that would fit in if it, if in fact it would. Is that a good idea? I think so. So my motion was simply to, uh, for a request for a one time 10 million addition, $10 million addition to the budget for, for the use of poor, uh, air conditioning. Okay. And, and you wanted to, your amendment um, says that that money would be used to cool classrooms that wouldn't otherwise get air conditioning by 2017. Correct. With the, with the air conditioning project getting started immediately. All right. So uh, is there a second to Ms. Causey's motion? Second. All right. So I think we've discussed it. Can you uh, give a roll call again? Sure okay, Ms. Causey. Yes. Mr. Collins. No. Ms. Eaton. Yes. Mr. Gillis. No. Ms. Johnson. No. Mr. McDaniels. No. Ms. Miller. Yes. Mr. Birch. No. Ms. Williams. No. Okay. Doesn't, okay, the, the, the amendment didn't carry. Okay. All right. So now let's uh, vote on the original motion. Excuse me. Yes, I'm sorry. I'd like to say that I think that, that uh, the position this board should take is one that is um, expressive of everyone desiring a healthy learning environment for all the students of Baltimore County, but that for us to get uh, into any fray between our funding sources is unwise and inappropriate and um, I think that uh, we should um, restrict our position at this point to just expressing a support for healthy learning environments for all children and not support a uh, one-time uh, ten million dollar addition. All right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Collins. I uh, agree with Mr. Gillis, and for that reason, I am voting for the amendment because Mr. Gillis made a perfect argument in favor of the amendment. Um, oh. That's exactly what we're all about. Did what you we're mean being the amendment or the motion? Uh, I meant the motion. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, I think my good friend, uh, Councillor Gillis, made a perfectly good, loyally argument for the amendment because, in fact, uh, for us, motion. I keep saying amendment, but you know what I mean. Um, I think it's important that we make a clear statement. I, I, I think we, I think we owe it 
to the public to make this kind of a statement as a board. And um, I hope we will, because I think it's exactly what uh, Vice Chairman Gillis, and being serious, I mean, I was being a little wise guy-ish a minute ago, although I believe what I said, but uh, I think we really owe it to our folks who have come here day after day, rather meeting after meeting in, in large numbers from all over the, the county, all demographic groups, all age groups, kids, parents, everybody telling us about the need for air conditioning. And I think it's, I think it, I think it's a very powerful statement and it's also a reflective of, of a board being independent and, and uh, responsive. And I think that's a positive thing for us to be. Uh, and I, I would hope that we would pass uh, the amendment. The or the motion. I keep saying amendment. I'm sorry. All right. If there's uh, Ms. Uh, Miller, did you have any further? OK, if there's no uh, further uh, discussion, I'd ask Ms. Decker to call the roll for a vote on the motion to that Ms. Johnson has presented. Okay. Mr. Causey? Yes. Yes. Ms. Eaton? Yes. Mr. Gillis? No. Johnson? Yes. Mr. McDaniels? Yes. Ms. Miller? Yes. Mr. Birch? Aye. Ms. Williams? I abstain. So what was the uh, count? Six votes. Six. Okay, so the motion passes. <clears throat> so, uh, were there other questions that you were? No. Uh, I okay. believe we covered all the ones that I was aware of, so we can go to questions. Uh, Mr. Collins. Uh, I, have, I have a question, George. Um, in honor, in, not an honor, in response to the, the <laughs> that could be an honor to the gentleman from Delaney High School, the business department chairman, whose name I forget, Mr. Holt. Pat Holt. Right. Pat. I don't know Pat, but I uh, admire him for coming, as I did everyone last week. And I want to publicly put on the record, as I did in closed session, my great uh, compliment of the chairman and of, of Ms. Decker, our administrative assistant, for uh, orchestrating and um, organizing the public hearing in the, in the professional and, and, and outstanding manner that it was, um, it was done in, and that every single person who wanted to speak uh, had an opportunity to speak, and, and they all spoke uh, and stayed within the time limit, and I thought it was a superbly run meeting, and I want to compliment Debbie and, and uh, Chuck in particular for that effort. Um, having said that, following up on what you said, uh, you piqued my interest when you said there was $4 million worth of one-time administrative costs. Correct. So um, in the administrative Just section of the budget, we have all of our technology expenditures. And uh, of those, uh, 3.1 million is um, related to an upgrade of our financial uh, accounting and payroll systems. And um, let's see here. That, that was not people, that was stuff. That's, that's stuff, right. Um, we also have uh, half a million dollars in fiber optic cabling. I don't need to know anymore. Okay. I just want to know, let me ask you this, is any of yeah. that four million dollars <laughs> people? No. Okay, no. good. One times are One -times typically non-salary. Yeah, I, I, I think. What, I, what yeah. I was getting at is I, I didn't know if it was like, because we, we're always uh, changing people's titles, which results in getting, them getting a bump in salary, which I always vote for, but I didn't know if that was part of what you were talking about. No. Um, if this is the appropriate time, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make, um, uh, I'd like to ask a question and then make a motion. Yes. Um, George, I believe, and I, I hope the, the majority of the board also believes that um, our 
the uh, audit department that works for the board. They need an additional person, at least one more. Um, and I want to make a motion. I don't know. Um, I want you to tell me, um, do I need to specify an amount of money for that as uh, Mrs. Johnson just did? Uh, or do I, would I just make a motion that we add a position? Um, Correct. Okay. And, and the board has done that in the past. Okay. And, if, and what we'll do is uh, bring it back to you with a dollar amount um, on the second Good. or whatever date the budget vote actually occurs, and it'll be approximately eighty-five thousand dollars in that neighborhood. Okay. I, I I believe that. Uh, uh, I second that motion. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> you all know my motion, and I'll. St I uh, thank you. Uh, okay, is there a further discussion? We have a motion and a second. Is there a more discussion, Miss Causey? I completely agree. The Internal Audit uh, Department works tirelessly to protect the assets of uh, the school system, and uh, the dollars that they save with their work um, is is very valuable. Um, and as the students have grown, the amount of money coming in and out of high schools and elementary schools and middle schools has grown. The number of personnel has grown. The number of assets has grown. So it only makes sense that our internal audit committee also grows to properly manage all of that in 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 the best manner possible. So I'll be voting yes for that. Mr. Uh, Chairman, yeah. um, um, it's part of the board's fiduciary duty to monitor so much. And the vehicle, the mechanism by which that monitoring occurs is the audit. Uh, the audit, audit department, the Office of the Auditor, and they haven't been able to have enough staff to do what they need to do because they report directly to this board. Uh, we've had discussions over the past number of months, and uh, uh, Mr. Collins and I just recently had this discussion on this very same topic. Um, I think it, um, it's a bit of a jump down from $10 million, which was the cost of the last question you had, George. <laughs> 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 this one's only eighty thousand, uh, as your estimate, I understand. But I, I, I think it's absolutely essential that the board vote, and I would uh, recommend to my fellow board members that they support uh, Mr. Collins' motion. Yeah. Um, I'm also going to support Mr. Collins' motion. Um, I just want to um, state to the board: I think we have to have some more discussion um, about the function of the internal audit group. We can clarify that, but I don't want to. Uh, confuse the motion or dissuade, you know, the comments, but uh, um, we still really need to, as a board, agree how we want to use that uh, department, but it, they do need more support. And, and I think that's perfectly appropriate for us to do, Mr. Chairman, at, at any time, because the, they work for us. The, the, and uh, uh, I just uh, agree completely with what you said. And, and just for clarification, PRSC will be addressing um, the role of the audit um, committee. Uh, okay. We had discussions during our last PRC meeting, um, and we will be following up on that. Very good, very good. So, if there's no further discussion, um, you want to? Um, we're going to ask for a roll call too, Ms. Decker, to vote on it, Mr. Collins' motion. Ms. Yes. Ms. Collins. Yes. 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 Mr. Gillis. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Yes. Ms. Miller? Yes. Mr. Birch? Aye. Ms. Williams? Yeah. Yes. Okay, the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Collins and Ms. Decker. Thank you, colleagues. <coughs> Ms. Miller? Yes. Um, I have um, several areas of concern that I'd like to address, and I'm going to fumble through this a bit because I gave myself a crash course on the budget over the past four days, and I read the entire budget book. Uh, I'm in no way, you know, fully understanding of it, nor the process here. So I'm kind of learning the process uh, on the spot. Um, the, the overriding issue I have is that I don't believe that we're spending our resources according to correct priorities. So I'd like to talk about some of the issues that I have. One of them you mentioned already, which was the uh, an administrative issue of that, you know, being a large 
um, uh, a large allotment. But I, in light of your comments, I, I still believe that we are very top heavy in our central office. And I'm going to point to some pages. I'm going to reference the budget book so that people who are watching live stream can follow along. Um, on page 69, and this has more to do with the comments of, of, by Patrick Holt, um, it shows administration over the four-year period has increased 32.2%. Now that's an average of about 8% per year. And when you compare that to some of the other categories, like instructional salaries, which increased 13.5% over the same period, and then you drop down to other instructional costs, which I don't really know what that is, that line item increased 430 percent over the four-year period, where special ed increased 9.3 percent, so just over 2 percent per year. Student transportation increased 15.7 percent over the four-year period. It, when you look at it and you compare against other areas, you get a better sense for our priorities and how we're spending our money. Um, as I looked at this issue of top-heavy central office, the entire section under the, super, the office of the superintendent, beginning on page 135, has a lot of big numbers that jumped out of, at me. Now, it, it might just be that, you know, I don't have a lot of information, but I'll point to certain areas that concerned me. Um, particularly the chief communications officer, and by that I mean the office of the chief communications officer, not the individual. The assistant superintendent, HR staffing, that office. Chief accountability performance management officer. Uh, leadership development, I think I named five there, um, that, that had some huge figures that really um, I would, would really like to get more clarification on. I'll just pick out a few things for, as an example. On page 166, uh, the executive director of HR operations, um, if you look at the salaries, now the, the support staff, I mean the number of staff members went down considerably. But if you divide out the salaries by the number of staff, in FY15, the average was $158,000 for the 48 staff members. The next year in FY16, it was $342,000 per employee. And then it seems there was a, an adjustment made for FY17 so it's 167,000 per employee. What I see a lot here is that in FY16, there was, um, throughout this whole section, there was some tremendous spending that occurred. And it looks like that this year we're making some adjustments, which is good. But there's still some huge numbers here, and it concerns me in light of how we're spending in other areas. Um, another example in that section on page 171, the assistant superintendent HR staffing, the salaries went up this year by 111.6%, so they more than doubled. And then we've got this huge amount under other charges of $4.6 million, which I don't know what that is. But really, I'm just giving those as examples. This whole section is filled with those kinds of examples. So I think we've got some area here for reprioritizing when it comes to a top heavy administration. My second issue is the depletion of our surplus. By law, we have to keep a balanced budget. 
but it appears that the only reason that we have a balanced budget this year is that we're rating our general fund surplus by almost $19 million. And I'm referencing page 70. Um, in FY 2012, there was a surplus of $23 million. And really, it looks like, for the most part, it's steadily gone up to where this year we had a surplus of $58 million. But this budget proposes that we raid $19 million of it to leave us with $39 million. So I'm concerned with that, uh, and I'm wondering, is this a trend that's likely to continue? So, Mr. Sarris, I'll, I'll start off and I'll let you answer some of the specifics sure. of Mr. Miller, uh, Ms. Miller's questions. Um, a part of what the board has seen over the last three years is central office reorganizations and consolidations. So in prior years when we've had sort of our individual meetings with board members and we've shared it publicly too, in terms of redirects and operational cost savings that we looked in terms of what we do with a zero-based budgeting approach. Um, if you take sort of the Office of Communications, um, before I got here, there was sort of an Office of sort of strategic planning, but also like support services for schools where maybe copy and print was, logistics and um, things like that. We consolidated that office and such like copy and print went over to the Department of Communications. In addition, the board in hiring me, we started talking about community outreach. Community outreach was then added to the Department of Communications and government relations is added to the Department of Communications as well too. Because we pride ourselves in making sure the budget book is accurate, you'll see adjustments made to those offices to reflect those individuals that have been consolidated consolidated with those offices. Um, if you think about sort of the Office of Assistant Superintendent for HR Staffing, um, the board every single year approves the organizational charts of executive directors on up um, who report to me um, and to the various chiefs. Um, that was when we moved Ms. Maria Lowry over to that position and many of the HR staffing then became consolidated um, with um, and Ms. Lowry. So the first sort of five things you sort of pointed out, um, Ms. Miller, and we can definitely share any other information the board might want, um, were from reorganizations and central office consolidations that now match those numbers in the budget book. Uh, Mr. Saras, I know you'll probably add a little bit more to that in addition to mm -hmm. sort of the other charges being uh, health care and benefits. Right. Um, I believe the superintendent is exactly right. And what happens, and I'll ask Kelly Wynn to just double check me as I say this, when we reorganize departments and we move people around, the, uh, the focus and the mandate that we have from the superintendent is to do so with no net increase in FTEs. And that's the case here. But when we, for instance, if you look, um, there's a year lag time typically between the change in the FTE numbers and the dollars because the FTE, FTE numbers can be changed easily. The dollars cannot be changed because we have it. It uh, it requires us to go back to the county and reallocate dollars between activities, and so there is that. There's a, a delay uh, when we add and a delay when we subtract FTEs from one area to another. Kelly, do you have any corrections for me? Is that about right? Okay, um, and uh, the other question about fund balance, I think, uh, is an important topic to bring up. Um, if you look on page 70, you'll, as you point out, uh, you can see that really since 2012, the use of uh, fund balance has really fluctuated between a fairly narrow range of 17, uh, 15 to 19 million dollars, but um, generally uh, three of those years higher than the midpoint or higher than 15,000. Um, we work very closely with the county government because they view this uh, as an important source of funding to minimize maintenance of effort and any other additional dollars that they have to take from other sources. So um, they're sometimes too large of a fund balance is criticized because there's taxpayers' dollars that are sitting there unused and, and both we and the county have made an effort to uh, maximize the impact of that as a funding source. And when we use it, we also 
are looking at money that we hope to add to it this year. So for example, my current projection would be that we'd add more than 20 million back to fund balance by the end of the year. So we take that into consideration as well. Um, and so you're describing it as sort of a cyclical thing. Um, sort of cyclical, but very, uh, yes, not, not subject to factors outside of our control like the economy and so forth, but rather very uh, actively managed by ourselves and, and the county for, for this express purpose. Is it fair to say that the 19 million that was used was for STAT? No. No. So what was the 19 million that Ms. Miller was pointing out that came out of the fund balance? It's used for a number of, you know, for all of our expenditures in proportionate basis. I mean, it doesn't get allocated to anything specifically. I think the, it's important. The, it's just the total general funds budget, which is all non-specific. So we have all our revenue sources that equal the general funds budget, but within that, you don't tie each state source or uh, other than uh, the things specifically funded by the county, um, we don't tie the dollar to, you know, this person or that person. I think it's one thing, one important thing for the board to know, even though the budget is $1.5 billion, we don't spend $1.5 billion. So. Um, if the board has not given contract authority or uh, uh, authorized us to spend dollars, we don't spend it. But also, as positions come open that are non-school-based uh, positions, we scrutinize those. Matter of fact, I do it personally to figure out if we need to fill those positions. Um, and so having a healthy fund balance each year of roughly 20 to $24 million for an organization with the size budget we are is very prudent to have anyway. I'm, okay, I'm only on number three of my concerns. So number three is the, uh, stat, the pr prioritization of the STAT program. I believe resolutely that we should not expand the implementation of STAT any further until we can begin seeing results from what we have already in place. Um, and if you go back and look at one year ago, the same discussion occurred and the board pushed forward with STAT without waiting for the pilot program results. And here we are again in the same situation. We still don't have results because last year we pushed forward without waiting for the pilot program. Um, I feel confident in assuming that STAT is the most expensive and transformative program in BCPS history. Would you agree with that statement? Um. Well, the most expensive thing we do, of course, is employ people. Um, it's beyond that. I don't know. It's up there. What you Not know? Not something to, to be taken lightly. With. Would you agree? Um, with so many needs that we have in our system, and we've been talking about some of them. Um, I think that our spending is not aligned with correct priorities, and. Um, the funding for STAT was made possible by redirecting money from other needs in the system um, to pay for STAT. And I give Dr. Dance credit for his resourcefulness and uh, perseverance in that. I'd like to see the funding um, proposed for STAT in this budget, the $14.5 million allotted instead to items which are a higher priority in terms of improving student outcomes especially in areas related to health and safety, such as facilities and transportation, special ed, and reducing class sizes by hiring more teachers instead of taking them away to fill non-instructional stat positions. Um, there are 168 stat teachers. We're not adding any new this year, but they are non-instructional positions. I'm also concerned about the renewal of the four-year lease that we have on the STAT devices. Um, we are in the process of overhauling our school system to accommodate STAT through those eight conversions. And the deeper we go, the more stuck we will be if when we get results, we find that they're not what we were expecting. 
our contractors will know if we continue down this road that we are stuck and I'm wondering uh, what is to prevent us from getting thoroughly hosed by our contractors at renewal and will we be able to sustain this program over time Miss Miller if I may when we were in a uh, meeting with Mr. Saris and we were talking about uh, several of these issues and I do want to thank Mr. Saris for his time when we had that meeting um, you made it clear about the lease for the digital devices that once we sign the lease we are obligated for four years is that was right. that correct for instance the you know we currently have an obligation for about 31 million dollars in leases that has to play out over a number of years regardless of <coughs> any policy changes that we make with stat so that'll be with us regardless of what we do going forward so if we if we expand stat to include high schools or additional grades those leases start and then they will run for four years and right. we'll be so legally obligated for those new leases it's a four-year commitment that begins in the year the budget year that it is approved so as a board when we're making decisions to expand the program we need to be concerned not only with this year's operating budget but we also need to be concerned with the next four years that we are now making the board obligated to pay is that a that, is that a fair statement yeah. okay so the decision really would be if we approve the budget as is as proposed it would be a four-year commitment regarding stat where if we held off on expanding the device portion not the whole stat program but the device portion which is the 14.5 million right. that's a one-year decision because next year we got a new budget so it's a one-year delay versus a four-year commitment um, I wanted to point to some items in the budget regarding the redirecting of funds to pay for stat uh, on page 202 it shows the 14 and a half million for stat uh, which goes towards the devices and it also shows the 1.1 million redirected from schools and offices and mr saris explained to me earlier today that that would be taking their items from schools and offices that are currently going towards curriculum and tech so it's curriculum and tech funding mm -hmm. for the schools right now would be redirected towards stat also on page 202 uh, no i'm sorry page 118 it shows the redirect of 964,000 from supplies and materials to the executive director of IT for STAT. And I understand that that is part of the 1.1 million, but I'm wondering what supplies and materials is not then being funded? Um, the I think I need to correct myself. I was looking at the eighty-three thousand when the I 80, gave eighty-nine thousand. Well, I'm on page one eighteen, or is my on another page? One eighteen, yeah. Yeah. So the nine hundred sixty-four thousand, and again, I'll ask Kelly to correct me, is um, ver similar to your question about human resources. I believe these are dollars that are being reallocated within the Department of Technology, is that correct? Rather than part of the, or is that part of the redirect? So on, on page 118, the 964,000 that's being transferred for stat, okay. those are items that the school would currently be using. Those are dollars that they would be using to purchase their own computers. So if we were not to lease computers, then the schools would have to purchase their own computers 
and replace them on a three-year basis. So what we have been doing is taking the funding that the schools were using themselves to fund their own purchase of computers and putting that into the central office so that we can centrally uh, lease those computers through staff. So that will be computers such as in the lab? Yes. Okay. Ms. Miller, may I? These are one-to-one so -one devices, not lab devices. Well, the, the right, old... Right, what it's taking from. It's, she's saying that that would be Well, however schools what? were using them. It may or may not have been in a lab, but presumably that's, you know. Okay. Um, the other redirect... Ms. Miller. Yes. May I interrupt for a moment? Yes. Relating to the high to the school budgets that are being reduced and then uh, that's being moved over, is that perhaps the problem at Randallstown that their individual school budget was reduced, but they don't have devices yet? So is that perhaps part of their funding problem or their hardship in in getting the uh, computers that they need for their magnet program? Uh, this well. It, First of all, magnets have, um, in addition to their, their normal per pupil appropriation, they have a separate magnet appropriation that they would use if they needed to purchase computers. Um, so so that's, magnets are, are a separate issue. Um, and also, just know that as we're taking money out of schools, we're doing it um, not all at once. So the elementary's schools, because they were getting devices first, were getting more of a reduction up front. The middle and highs have, have only gotten a percent of a reduction. Uh, we're assuming that they're not going to buy computers just before they get rolled out, but we're not taking all of their funding. We were taking it on a tiered approach. So, um, you know, 20%, then 40%, then 60% over the five year um, course of, of the STAT program. So only the elementary schools would have, by 2017, um, had the majority of their uh, technology taken out of their budget. So I think to clarify this redirect, then is not just being taken out of the schools that have the devices, but all the schools. Uh, on a sliding scale a sliding that scale. aligns with the rollout of the devices, correct? And one of the things to keep in mind with that is that even at the middle school and high school level when we started our elementary rollout, our middle school and high schools got carts of computers as well too. So a part of this was many of our high schools, like Cadenceville High School in particular, had maybe two laps for almost 1,900 students. So we were able then to, as we rolled out elementary devices, to add carts and more carts to schools so that the high school and middle school would be able to participate in part of the rollout as well too. But Kelly's exactly right. If schools did not get um, the one-to-one -one devices just yet, we were not gonna then take money from them because they were not fully participating um, in the program. <clears throat> uh, could I ask Mrs. Miller if I can just ask a quick question on topic? Okay, okay. Th thank you, uh, Ann. Um, <clears throat> just as a, to try to summarize, <clears throat> is, it is it safe to say uh, that our high school principals and middle school principals are significantly unhappy, uh, significantly unhappy about the, the uh, decline and decrease in their budgets? Uh, or is it just the ones that talk to me that are significantly unhappy? We haven't got any real data to answer that question. Well, hell no, you haven't, because I, I, they're scared to death. <laughs> well, no, I can. I, I talk well, to principals all the time. I can tell Mr. Collins, I think it's half and half, if I were yeah. honest with you. Um, but I think also what principals see is that they're not having to pay for their printers anymore. <clears throat> they're not having to pay for their That's copies or their anymore. No, we, we, we're actually paying for those printers for them, whether they've been centralized or not. We're pay, taking care of that. They're not having to go out, and principals did this. They're not having to go out to Best Buy and purchase computers, which some of our principals did in some cases. Centrally now, we actually have leveled the playing field across our schools saying you will have X and we're going to pay for X. Um, those 
principals who now understand they don't have to do that, I think some of them are saying, no, okay, I'm fine with it. Some of the principals who are saying, no, I want to do my own thing, I mean, I think some of them, to be honest with you, are, might be a little upset. Um, but I think what we've tried to do with principals is to say we, we understand, because all of many of us in these roles have been principals before, is how do we make sure we're doing this in a strategic way so you're not losing money all at one time and you're still getting the needs of your school met. For example, and on the curriculum material side, our principals don't pay for new curriculum materials. We pay for that. The only thing they're paying for is they have to replace those materials. That's a change. So a part of this is we've actually centralized some of these purchases so that we're actually getting a better deal in terms of using our dollars so schools are not having to pay for individual uh, you know, programs or textbooks on their own. I think uh, so Dallas, I, Dallas, I know that you believe what you just said. No, but, I can give you probably 20 principals but I, but, who I talk to all the time who will tell you the same. Yeah, I, I'm sure you can. And, I, and all I'll, I'll just say that is my, it would be my belief that uh, it's half and half because you're the one that's asking the question. Because uh, the, the half, the half that tell you, half are telling you the truth, and half of you are telling the half, half of a truth. But that's reality when you're dealing with uh, talking to the boss who's who's committed to, to uh, significant uh, changes in 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 so many approaches uh, in such a rapid, in such a rapid way. But I just want to put a little word in for the principals, uh, who, uh, whatever their numbers are. Uh, that somebody is hearing you, at least hearing you. And I'm not saying that I'm capable of fixing it, but uh, we're hearing you. And um, we are operating on a lot of uh, blind faith that, this, that at least uh, some of what we're doing in the long run is going to <coughs> bear fruit, even though it's hard to find the fruit so far. But it's very early in many of these processes. Bye. Thank you, Ann. Not to get too far off topic, but to respond to that, I think that it's not um, totally accurate to say that the central office is paying for things like the print, print management because the schools, um, the school budgets, I believe, are, are being docked 30% or 15% for those services. So. You know, it's not that you're taking it all out of their hands. Um, but to continue on this before, I, I just want to hit oh, my Ms. other Ms. points. Miller, if possible, can I res sort of respond to that yeah. one for a little bit? So for principals who, and George or Kelly, or would definitely um, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, for principals who've actually been optimized by print management and have the new devices, we are in fact paying for that where through their own budgets, they would have had to do that um, in the past. For schools that have not been fully optimized yet with the new devices, if a principal had to pay X number of dollars for a copy or a lease or for that warranty, or if that printer or copy or broke down, they would have to pay for it out of their own budget. Um, consequently, because we've sort of redirected those funds, we are paying for that uh, now. In addition, what that does for us, it does for the schools that have been optimized, gives us a better rate in terms of how much we're paying for those copies or leases or for that toner. Um, my final just thought to leave um, everyone with regarding this is um, if we move forward like we did last year, before we have any kind of empirical evidence of success with the program, then one year from now we'll be in the same situation because we won't have the ability to look at our, our pilots. Because we moved forward last year, we had a pilot program in the elementary schools, 10 schools, and we could have compared at that point the 10 non-lighthouse, I mean the non-lighthouse elementary schools against the 10 lighthouse schools. Because we pushed forward without waiting, now all the elementary schools have them and we have no way of comparing. If we do this again, we'll be in the same situation. I want to move on with a, a couple other areas of concern, and I'll be very brief on these. Number four is special ed. Now, I, I applaud the increase in the special ed teachers provided, um, but I don't think it's enough. And from what I've been hearing from many parents, that, that is their sentiment. Um, our equity policy is meant to um, provide for the needs of each individual student. Now, our special ed community of students are our most needy and, and have the most need for individualized instruction. I'm concerned with the high staffing ratios in the special ed category, and I 
I'm referencing page 121, particularly those in the LRE and LRB categories. Now my number five concern, of course, is the air conditioning, which we've talked about, so I'm, I'm going to skip over that. Um, I hope that Dr. Dance will request the funding for the portable AC units on January 27th. Um, and number six is transportation. We need bus drivers. There's a lot of safety issues around transportation. Um, kids are taking one and a half hour bus rides each way. Kids are waiting in the mornings for their late buses to arrive. Some of them don't arrive. And they're in the cold and the dark and their parents have already left for work. This is a, a matter of safety. Um, number seven is instructional teachers. We need to lower our class sizes by hiring more instructional teachers. And with those 168 stack teachers, they're being taken out of the instructional pool. Uh, they could be redirected or some of them could be redirected. Um, so those are the areas. So I, I am very concerned about pushing forward with STAT. I think we should hold off for a year, get some results, quantitative results, take that $14.5 million and spend it on other priorities such as special ed, facilities, transportation, and hiring more teachers. Um, so I guess I would like to offer that as a motion, that that's what we do. What is, can you restate your motion, please? That we hold off on further expansion of STAT and use the $14.5 million instead for the areas of special ed, facilities, transportation, and hiring more teachers. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second it. All right, um, is there a discussion? I have a question for Mr. Saris. Uh, regarding the motion? Regarding the motion. Sure. sure. So Mr. Saris, for the $14.8 million that Ann Miller is referencing, what exactly is that intended to go towards as it stands now? That would be the leasing costs, or is that? For which grades, for which? Well, that would be, um, let me make sure I get this correct. If I don't, Dallas will correct me. Um, the uh, middle school, uh, seventh grade f for in the lighthouse schools, um, the kindergarten four and five um, in the so, so this one I can help Mrs. Sarah out. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I got you, George. Um, so remember. Uh, so fun to watch him. <laughs> I'm just kidding, um, George. George, my buddy. We spent 12 months together with this budget. Um, so remember, um, during the budget proposal, we talked about going back, looking at our approach to kindergarten. So we'll be more so looking at a kindergarten pod approach for next year. This does look at four and five for the remaining elementary schools who are non-lighthouse. It does look at all sixth grade and all of our middle schools. It looks at seventh grade and our seven lighthouse schools, and it looks at Lighthouse High Schools as well. That's that. That's only three schools, Dallas, right? At three, this point, three it's, Lighthouse Schools. At this point, it's three schools. But those, that's are all grades in the oh, no. school. Oh yes, sir. Yeah, it's all grades in three schools. Yes, sir. Did you say? Did I? Do I remember correctly uh, that you said that that, that was going to be a three-year pilot? Be a two, that'd be a two-year. Yes, sir. So we would have Lighthouse High Schools for two years. The same three. We're not going to add more. Yes, the same three for. Any high, high, lighthouse high schools that are decided would be a two-year period. Yes. And the way I understood you is to say the way you were slowing down, Stad, in your in your speech. Let me see if I understand for sure. Um, <clears throat> we were not going to have it in kindergarten at all. So kindergarten. We're looking at the instructional approach. I'm looking at you, Verlita, now to go to more of a pod. And I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Verlita.
it would be better if you turned that on. <laughs> or just pretend you're in class and shout. Yeah. 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 Uh, That's good. Uh, <laughs> Pods, which is the natural flow of a kindergarten classroom. Okay, well, what are we doing now with, with devices in kindergarten? We, don't have, we only have devices in kindergarten in our White House. Okay. Our okay, so, so Dallas, your proposal, I'm sorry, really. So your proposal is to, is to not have devices in kindergarten. I thought that you... We would not have one-to-one -one devices in kindergarten. Uh, for the 10 Lighthouse schools that have them, we would rework and, you know, rework those so they are a pod approach for kindergarten. Um, again, we don't have it in kindergarten in the non-Lighthouse elementary schools. We'll be moving to grades four and five um, in those schools. So in kindergarten, we're just going to move from the 10 Lighthouse schools to a, a pod approach in those 10 for, schools for, and no other, uh, no other kindergarten schools? Yes, sir. Okay, good. And then, and then we're not going to extend the, uh, we're going to extend the Lighthouse schools in middle school to the seventh grade. Yes, sir. And expand it to the other sixth grades in middle school, but not to the sixth and seventh. Just to the sixth, yes, Just sir. Just to the sixth. Three high schools, nine through 12, for two years as a pilot program to see how that goes. Yes, sir. And we're going to complete the uh, fourth and fifth grade in all of the schools in our system so you're going to have one through five with individual devices in every school in every f uh, first through fifth grade yes sir and, and with this approach instructionally no student would go without a, would not go with a year without a device if the board decides to amend that you will have kids who are in third grade right now who will go to fourth grade would not have a device okay i I was thinking about that coming over. I knew you had said you were slowing it down, but I was trying to frame in my mind how it was being slowed down. The intention, I, uh, this is not a fair question, so I'll stop. Well, and thank you. Thank you. It's Ms. Kazi. To follow up with that, the high school pilots, the three high school pilots, when you say it's a two year program, you're saying that you're not going to expand it for two years, but we will, in fact, be obligated to four-year leases for three entire high schools. So... Right. Y yes, you will. Um, right. So, I so can that's, that's a very, very large obligation, in addition to the fact that all of the courses of all of those high schools, and each high school doesn't have exactly the same courses. Some have, um, you know, Latin, some don't, and so on. So it's a wide variety of courses that would have to be uh, moderated or through the curriculum department to, to be adapted to the devices, to that instructional model. Uh, that concerns me because this year, at the beginning of the year, Verlita, you can check my numbers, um, we had 267 courses currently in beta. So I used to sell software, so I know what that means. Beta means it's not ready for prime time, there's bugs, it's being changed, and so forth. So if we have that currently with the current program, my concern is trying to adjust all of the curriculum for all of those different courses that are available in high school when this is where the rubber hits the roads for the kids in trying to do well in their courses, um, I do well in their math classes, especially in English and so forth, when they're trying to do well on the SATs or the ACTs as they choose and getting college and career ready. So I think it is a big step and I do think that there's a number of um, concerns in, in moving forward when we don't have quantitative data that it's helping our students in ways where when we spend the money on ways that we do know it helps with having experienced teachers in a good ratio for those students, um, especially for our little people, the kindergartners. That's, that's a, a concern that I've heard a lot from, from folks about not having those kindergarten assistants. So to Ms. Causey's point, and Verlita, you might be able to add to this, or Dr. Um, Weisenhoff might be able to add to it as well. Um, the current curriculum development plan actually matches our rollout plan. So if the board decides to, to, to go a different route, we would have to adjust the curriculum development plan too. And Verlita, you or Dr. Weisenhoff can 
can speak to that in terms yes. of teachers writing curriculum. Yes, thank you for that. Yeah, again, we're not waiting. Again, curriculum has to run out front of the curriculum revision process runs outside of the other conversions because we need to make sure that schools are ready and prepared. So we have not waited. And then when we say 267 are in beta, that's actually um, not accurate. So we have 200, we had 267 when we met at the beginning of the year that had been loaded into BCPS1. Uh, so then we only have uh, a few a portion of the number, and I can get you the exact number, that are actually in beta form, that are being field tested. Uh, so then uh, we're looking at how many are actually in BCPS1. So again, like Dr. Dance said, the, the five-year curriculum plan runs um, alongside and, and is the driving force um, behind all of the uh, conversions. So we want to make sure that we're prepared with curriculum. So that curriculum is loaded into BCPS1 when the curriculum writers uh, uh, loaded, and then it is um, beta and field tested prior to implementation. So we, we will be prepared. I think Ms. Williams, you had a Yes. Um, I, too, am concerned about the student-teacher ratio. Um, I am concerned about the 168 STAT teachers being taken out of the pool and re reallocated to STAT, um, but I'm not uh, in favor of slowing down STAT because I am concerned that um, some of our kids at some of the grade levels will end up, if we modify this, will end up not having the devices that they started with in their prior grade. And I, if I, I was just going to make a comment also. Um, with my background as an engineer, I'm also concerned, very concerned. I, I think as long as I've been on the board, to try to get metrics that uh, will keep, allow us to keep track of the investments that we've made, and I agree that um, we just don't have that information. But again, my perspective still is that um, uh, with regard to uh, technology and education, um, I still think we as a county, we as a country, are falling behind the integration of technology into education. I'm aware that in our most competitive universities that they fully integrated digital technology into learning years ago. I also understand it's the difference when you're talking about a 20-year-old student and a 10-year-old student. There are some concerns that exist. but. Um, in terms of uh, our lifestyle and, and, and how things have changed over the last 10 or 15 years, the way we bank, the way we do, you know, keep track of medical records, we're using technology uh, in, in, in ways that are, are, are vastly changing. And it seems logical to me that we would also want to take advantage of technology in the educational process. And we as a board uh, adopted the STAT, STAT initiative years ago. And um, I am just going to support the continued uh, use of STAT and implementation of it. Uh, while, again, unfortunately, we don't have the data to support it. But again, just my life experience and world experience, I think we are falling behind in the STEM fields and in the in, in understanding of technology and education. And I'm going to support the continued funding of STAT. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Well, I was just going to say, but to Ann uh, Miller's point, is there any way we can not be bound by the four-year uh, lease? Mm, no. The, I've the looked at the contract, and it's pretty clear what? that we have a commitment. One thing I, I would say, and to, to speak to Ms. Williams and Ms. Causey's point, um, in terms of uh, class sizes, weekly I meet with the assistant superintendents and we actually make adjustments to class sizes once we realize that it's gotten over our projected ratio and principals cannot balance that. Um, principals will be getting their staffing tomorrow um, and I know as Ms. Lowry and Dr. Mayo meet with principals, um, we have, and this, these are ways that are not shown within this budget because we just work with schools, we have ways in which working with them they can actually assist with their class sizes within their, their master schedule. So we'll be giving them additional staffing tomorrow, particularly at the high school level that will work with them with their department chairs as they build their master schedules um, as well too. Um, and in addition, again, um, we make class sizes adjustments throughout the course of the entire year. I want to say just this week we allocated additional positions at, to a school because
because of class sizes and growth that has, that has occurred. When you have a budget of this size and you look at the number of teachers within our budget, um, and Abby, you, you know this, you and I talk about this a lot too, um, we build back a, a certain number of positions just for that reason. Um, so at the beginning of the school year, we need to make adjustments or throughout the year as class sizes at a particular school get to a certain level, we will make those adjustments centrally to provide for lower class sizes. I want to respond sir, to, what, oh, uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Mr. Collins has been waiting and okay. we'll get, get around. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect to, to you and uh, my other colleagues on the board who were here last year, uh, you would have the metrics uh, much in a much better format if you had listened to me last year when I suggested that we not expand at such a rapid pace, but rather um, maybe expand to another 15 schools so we would have a method of comparison. Um, I also believe very strongly in technology in schools. Um, and you're absolutely right about our colleges and universities being ahead of us. But we don't know how this is all working at all. And, and, the, and the comparisons and the minimal amount of information we're getting from the data so far is not very good. Now, I'm not a big fan of tests at all. And, and um, I certainly realize and believe that this is a process. It's a process of the teachers learning how to use these, the stuff. It's a process of the curriculum making sense. Um, we know the fiasco we had with the, with the um, language arts in the elementary school by rushing too fast. Uh, we're, just, we're just going awfully fast, and we're going to be spending a couple of billion dollars, that's with a B, at least on this project over the next five to ten years or more before we get really adequate adequate results. I don't know where we, we take a pause. I'm glad we're taking as small a pause, or I should say that the re superintendent has recommended at least a small pause this year. Uh, I think probably the introduction into the high schools is a bad idea, but um, uh, and, and uh, these four-year contracts, you know, are, are really, really shaky because we are, we are clearly a victim in this system of the, of the technological educational complex. President Eisenhower warned the country uh, many years ago when he left office against the military industrial complex. Well, we are hook, line, and sinker in this system, absolutely bought and paid for by the educational technological complex. It's almost scandalous, and I hope it never becomes a scandal. I'm not suggesting that it does, but when I see them sponsoring for thousands of dollars the state of the school's address and things like that, I begin to wonder. We're giving us awards from phony organizations that they pay for. I begin to wonder. However, having said that, I, I really wish we would be a little wiser and a little more um, thoughtful before just barging ahead and doing all of these things in hopes that they all work out. Because I don't have any idea if they're going to work out and the preliminary information isn't good. I'm not buying the preliminary information hook, line, and sinker at all. But um, I think we, have, we should pay attention to it. We should, there's nothing wrong with slowing down just a little bit. I'm glad that the superintendent wants to slow down a little. Maybe we should slow down a little more. I, I think we should definitely not do the high school piece um, in this coming year. I just think that that's, that's really a loopy idea. I wanted uh, Mr. to. Mr. Ver can I, Mr. Virch, and then we'll come back. Because we have a motion, we have a motion, we yes. eventually have to. Could Mr. Virch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, George, how you doing? George, I have something to return to you from when we had our budget uh, uh, discussion back in December. I left with a couple of souvenirs. One was uh, a reference to what I call the Grail document, the history of STAT before, current, and uh, in the future. But I also left with George Saris's adopted budget for 2016. So I want to make sure I return this to you. There you go. Um, you did say uh, that we are committed to these, this four-year lease, is that that's correct? Correct. Um, For the leases we've already uh, got, signed. that we have signed. Right. Um, the superintendent, I understood, um, um, Superintendent Dan, you indicated that, that if this isn't working out, we can sever these leases, is that correct? 
No, we can't sever the four-year lease. Mm -hmm. um, we have built into um, any contract that we have that we can get out of the contract. However, if this is a four-year lease, we are obligated to that four-year lease. Well, here's why I'm asking this, because, Verlita, I, I, if I understood you correctly, you had indicated that the curriculum has to precede the devices. Because if you don't have the curriculum, then the devices are just, you know, tossing a laptop at a, you know, a, a student that's, you know, uh, treading water someplace, and that that's not productive. My understanding is that that's exactly what has, you know, that that process. And it's good that we're aware that that is not a good process because there are some jurisdictions that did just that, gave a laptop, gave laptops to kids, and didn't have the curriculum loaded in. What I wanted to just verify, though, is that it's Pearson that's providing. Some of this, uh, some of this software for these, uh, or, or some of the curriculum for our our devices. Is, is, is Pearson one of those folks providing anything to us with regard to the STAT initiative? Our curriculum is written by our teachers and for our teachers. So there's no there's no Pearson software loaded onto any of these devices. We may have um, Ryan. I'm going to look to you. Envision. We have some of our math materials resources. And that's Pearson. Here's why, I, and here's where I'm going with these questions. Because there, there's a school district out there. It's the LA uh, United School District. They use Pearson products. They use those products in Apple devices. And just as the chair said that he's uh, an engineer and he takes interest in certain engineering things, and Ms. Causey said that she was in sales of software, well, when I hear the word litigation with some of the background I have as an attorney, well, my ears perk up. And my understanding is that there's the potential for litigation between the L.A. school district and Pearson over what was loaded into these these laptops that their students had. Now, Mr. Collins used to figure of, of a couple of billion dollars. The L.A. district, you know, they spent over a billion dollars. So the questions that, that are coming out tonight are not why technology is a bad thing and not that our students shouldn't be prepared for the future, but it's whether we've looked at this from enough sides to protect ourselves. Because if we are locked in, yeah. then we've spent the money and we don't have any other option than to turn to the general counsel and say, is this worth litigating? So I can't speak to another school system and I wouldn't try to speak to another school system. What I can tell you is that Baltimore County has not purchased devices with preloaded software. Um, I think Verlita is exactly right. Our teachers have written our curriculum, which is the scope and sequence, our pacing guides. Uh, many of our lesson plans are really written by our teachers and adopted. But if you look for instructional materials and resources, you're going to find a wide variety throughout all of our content areas. Um, that might be from Pearson, McGraw-Hill, from you know, various um, you know, service providers, but we did not, and I would never have recommended that you purchase a device with preloaded software. Um, Ms. Miller, you uh, had a right. We still have your motion on the floor, yes. so we have to eventually I, vote on that. I just wanted to respond, actually, to your comment about um, the concern of us falling behind in technology. And, and I wanted to remind everyone that Johns Hopkins, our, our consultant on this, who has been evaluating this, said um, themselves that what BCPS is doing dwarfs in scope what any other district around the country has been doing. So we're taking on a huge, I mean, we're moving at a pace greater than anyone else. It, this is truly experimental. Um, no one else is moving at the pace that we're moving at. I think we should wait the year, get evidence of success, and we can revisit moving on at that point. Okay. Now, I'm gonna, because it's been a while, I, I'd like you to restate. Your motion's been on the floor and it's been seconded. Uh, so if you could state it for us so we can uh, have a vote. Uh, I move that we delay implementate or expansion of the rollout of the stat devices until uh, um, empirical <coughs> evidence no. is available is that the right word empirical just stick with the money amount to make it something understandable okay mm -hmm. um, just move that we don't spend the 14 and a half million or whatever it was until there is quantitative evidence of success and spend the um, and spend the fourteen and a half million 
dollars on other priorities. All right, and I think that motion was seconded. And our student member does not vote, but that's correct. Okay, and uh, Ms. Uh, Decker will call the roll f to vote, please. Yes, in support of the motion. Collins. No. Zeton. No. Mr. Gillis. No. Ms. Johnson. No. Mr. McDaniels. No. Ms. Miller. Yes. Mr. Birch. Nay. Ms. Williams. No. <coughs> Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, could I make a motion at this time with Mr. Are you finished, Ann? Yes. Okay. I, I would like to make a motion that we do not begin the expansion of STAT into the high schools in the, in the, in the next school year, that we scrap that small piece of the, uh, of the uh, STAT initiative, that, we, uh, that that's, that is a bridge too far, that we're moving too quickly. and. I think that that's unwise to try to do that at this time. We should at least get it all implemented in the elementary and middle schools, and uh, that's, that's going to take a few more years. I, I, I don't think it's wise to do that, even as a pilot in three schools. It's expensive. The curriculum is not is, is so diverse in our in our high schools and so uh, difficult to deal with. That's that's a whole another story. So, just very simply, I would make a motion that we that we do not expand the STAT program into the high schools in the school year 2016-17. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay, you have to move. And second, is there a discussion, Mr. Birch? Um, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to ask about um, the current administration's intent with regard to these kindergarten pods. I'm not at all clear whether and it, it may have been said in the back and forth, and I may have missed it, and if so, I apologize. Are we going to be giving laptops to all of our kindergarten students? Mr. Virch, um, No, because the reason I'm asking is because oh, I may offer an oh, amendment to Mr. Dewar Collins' motion. Okay. I'm sorry. But that's why, the, okay. that's, why the, that's why I want to get the answer rather than waste the, the board's time. To Mr. Virch's question, the answer is no, we will not be giving devices to all of our kindergarten. I appreciate the direct answer. Does that mean because of the number of kindergartens that we have, does that mean 5% of the kindergartens will get them, 10% of the kindergartens will get them? I suspect we have staff here who would be able to give us some estimate. How many are we giving them to? I'm looking at Verlita now for guidance since I know instruction was still working out the pod approach. You may have to use your cafeteria voice. You, you're a former high school principal, right? <laughs> Mr. Virch, it would it, the pod approach, actually many of our kindergarten classrooms have this approach right now. They, in many cases, they just have older technology right now. So they may have physical desktops in the back of a kindergarten classroom. So what we're looking at is an approach where a kindergarten teacher would have the ability to have um, a small group, maybe two, three, four, five kindergartners have the, have the ability to have those devices. Those devices wouldn't go home. Those devices wouldn't leave that classroom. They're available in, in small group instruction settings in all of our kindergarten classrooms. So versus I, every stu every kindergartner having a device. All right, so then there is no change contemplated for giving every kindergartner a device. Is that correct? Except for our okay. 10 lighthouse yeah. schools. But so then there would be 10 lighthouse schools that would, where, would we'll have be, kindergartens that, where, that have children that in pods would have their own device. No, we will be okay. changing our approach at those 10 lighthouse schools. So currently right now, no elementary school other than our 10 lighthouse have kindergartners with their own devices. We will be changing that approach for those 10 schools. And we Lions will. Mills as set forth. Yes, that is true. You're right. It, it is Lions I'm so sorry. We, board, it was Lions Mills. So, it, so it, it would be a, I hate to use this term, it would be a baby step. <laughs> it would not be everybody in kindergarten in every elementary school that has kindergarten would be receiving uh, would be receiving this change in approach. That the, is correct. The devices in the 11 schools that Dr. Dance spoke about would, would be redistributed mm -hmm. yes. in order to make sure that all of our elementary school kindergarten classrooms had um, small learning pods with devices. So we had, in other words, Rick, uh, Rick we had, I mean, I mean uh, Ryan, I'm sorry. <laughs> I changed your name, Ryan. In other words, we had, we had a device in the 11 lighthouse schools or Lions Mills plus the 10 um, for every kid. That's right. 
and now this coming school year, if this, if the budget goes through as proposed on this subject, they, all those kids won't have the devices, but rather we'll take those devices and probably have to buy a few more and allocate a, a, a cart worth of five to 10 or whatever number um, the curriculum folks say we should have in each of our element, uh, each of our kindergartens. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. And Mr. Collins, to your point, again, after observing the kindergarten classrooms, it follows the natural flow of instruction in kindergarten. Many of us are familiar with kind of the centered uh, type <coughs> of approach at the kindergarten level. That sounds and much better to me. Okay. That follows the natural flow of instruction. Earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, um, Ms. Williams. Uh, as to the um, motion that's on the floor, can you um, tell us how much of the 14.482308 would uh, apply to the grades 9 through 12? I could we can get that hazard a guess, but I'd feel better <laughs> um, sitting but down. But is it substantial or is it minuscule? Because Not otherwise, I mean, that matters to our vote tonight. If we're talking about removing, we're only talking about three yeah. new Lighthouse High Schools, grades 9 through 12. So I, I, I want to say that we're talking about maybe four to 5,000 devices for those three high schools compared with uh, a total of 28,000 devices. Does that sound about right, Lloyd? So we'd have to, you know, the dollars would would be directly proportionate to that breakdown, but we will like get you. Like 28,000 compared to like 4,000. Right, in other words. Right, four in other words and you're talking of, about devices, not right, dollars. It would be roughly 15, a 15% reduction in the cost. It's about two and a quarter million. Okay, and our quick calculation is two and a quarter million. And for the annual one of that, we right? Have so instead of fourteen and point five, it would be you know twelve point two. But to to add on to that, hand in hand with that would be the rest of the rollout. If we're not, you know, it's not just the devices. Then if we're not going to roll out to the high schools this year, there would also be additional costs, sa cost savings, in that we're not going to convert the curriculum right now. You know. The professional development that, all the other well done. to that point that's done. already been done yeah. so we've been developing high school curricula over the last three years um, sort of going along sort of with this plan and to miss you know two quick things um, in terms of the pace I would say we're going slower than other school systems just because we wanted to make sure we sort of matched it with our curricula um, but the other part of that too is that because of all the nuances that come with high school that's why I would argue you need two years because you know when you do elementary or middle you can bring on one grade level at a time because everyone's taking the same courses high school that doesn't work so if you want to get high school right you got to start with a small number in terms of uh, in terms of the number of kids number of schools but also you got to bring on the whole school and you're going to need two years in order to get that right you're going to need more than two years yeah. uh, miss johnson so i just want to say i am not um in favor of the motion on the floor simply because our high school students are the ones that are closest to graduation, that are closest to college and career ready, that are closest to needing to be globally competitive. And with these, the one-to-one -one conversion with the STAT initiative, that will help them, enable them to be globally competitive. Um, and while I know this is a huge undertaking in the state of Maryland, if we look outside of the state of Maryland, I'm sure globally this isn't, this isn't quite as, as huge of an, un an undertaking. But I am concerned, I understand Dr. Dance just said that They've been working on the high school curriculum for three years. Um, but with being on the curriculum committee, we see the vast amount of high school courses that are offered. I and mean, we just had a conversation about CTE. So it does worry me a little bit. And I, I hope that we are overly prepared that all that when we do, if we do do this rollout, that all of these curriculum, um, all these courses are ready to go with this one-to-one -one initiative. And I just, could I just add that we're, we're technically cutting part of the budget that we technically don't have, of course, until it goes to the county executive. So once we've taken a reduction here, it's, it would be less, it would be f significant in that it would be uh, unlikely that it would be, you know, we wouldn't know the future of those dollars once we take them out. So. Well, I think we, I think there's a follow-up motion that would come along in terms of hiring teachers for smaller class sizes, kindergarten okay. assistants, increasing the bus drivers, 
cameras on the, the not just the buses we own, but also the buses that we lease, because there's a large number of those buses that we lease in terms of safety and so forth. So, um, you know, okay. believe me, I don't think we're going below maintenance of effort here. So, um, <laughs> but but to, to a, a couple points. Um, one, uh, I was, I'm on a, a P20 um, Leadership Council with a number of folks from around the state, and uh, one of those is Dr. Jack Smith, our interim state superintendent, and we were on a telephone uh, conference call, and he was discussing his recent trip to uh, China, and there's a PISA study, P-I-S-A, um, that uh, is a global study of academic achievement. And one of the things that this uh, study was talking about, and Singapore is one of the, the top uh, countries in the world academically, um, is that, that part of that study is showing that students that have t a lot of access to computers are not necessarily achieving as much as other students that have more traditional uh, education systems. So it, it just points to that there's, there's not conclusive data. And so to say we need to move forward and rush out um, is not, there's, there's not data behind that statement. And this came, I think, to all of us uh, today, and it's a, it's a study, or it's a chart relating Baltimore County Public Schools, elementary schools, grade three, students meeting or exceeding expectations, scoring at levels four and five on the park test, which is the English language arts park test. And what it's showing here is that the non-lighthouse schools did better than the lighthouse schools. So we all agree that park is a baseline, but we do know that some counties did better than us, many counties. In fact, in certain grade levels, we're below the state average, which means we're number 13 out of 24 uh, jurisdictions. Um, you know, and, and I had asked when the high school park test came out and those results were discussed here that we should look at which schools did better in our district and which schools did better in other districts and do some analysis around that happened. Well, we didn't get any of that analysis, so I don't know who sent me this, but it looks really interesting and it looks like we need to do more of this. And I know that Park is not part of the Johns Hopkins test because the Johns Hopkins, uh, excuse me, evaluation, I was looking at that contract today and it specifically says qualitative in a number of places, which is concerning in and of itself. Um, so the push to move forward does not have research behind it. It's an experiment. We're paying a lot of money for an experiment. And we are putting our children's educational achievement into an experiment. And one of the things that I would suggest is that we keep some manner of a control group so that we don't, at the elementary school level, do away with students that are not using these devices because otherwise there is no way to compare what is working, what is not working. So that is a big concern and I would just ask Mr. Saris as a uh, follow-up to Romaine's mean question about the high school devices okay. are $2 million, but what's the cost of eliminating our control groups, those students that do not have the, the uh, devices? Well, we haven't worked on a control group basis. In other words, we haven't denied one group and privileged another so that we can compare the results. We have rolled it out wholesale. So, And so one thing I would remind the board too, and, and again, I believe our schedule, this is coming up um, very soon in terms of board update. Um, when we contracted with Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins developed the logic model for what the evaluation would look like. Year one looked at certain criteria. Year two looked at certain criteria, and that's, of course, we're in with the Lighthouse. Year three is when it was looking at academic achievement. So to your point, Ms. Causey, Park is included in the evaluation of it. I would just remind the board that under the Johns Hopkins logic model that they created, year three was when they looked at academic performance. So, so to say that park is not looked at, I don't know if that's an accurate statement. It's included in the logic model. Okay. Well, there was no analysis around park given to us, uh, it, such as this. I such don't know what that is. I can. Okay. I, it was here at my desk. So. Okay. Well, again, we have a motion, a second. Uh, I would just like to briefly speak to the motion that got a little bit off track, but that's okay because uh, you know everyone's questions and comments are very valuable, <clears throat> and. I, I just think that, um, again, as I said last year to the board, 
with uh, limited success. I think it got one vote mine. Um, I think we're just moving a little bit too fast. Um, <clears throat> I voted against the previous motion, but I, I think uh, I think to to begin to go into the high schools, knowing the enormous uh, the enormity of that expense uh, down the road, uh, and knowing knowing that uh, the the middle schools aren't ready to send the kids on to high school, uh, device ready, and the whole scene is simply not. You know, we're rushing too fast. I, I'm not even, although the money amount is interesting, I'm not talking about the money. I'm talking about the, uh, I'm using the budget uh, as, as a policy device as opposed to a financial instrument because it's what's before us. I just believe that it's, a, it's unwise policy to, to begin to introduce this into the high schools. But incidentally, it will be an enormous dollar figure as we roll it out. And once again, we're just simply not ready to go there, notwithstanding the um, superintendent's assurances that the curriculum is ready. Um, I find that a bridge a bit far to go, but uh, I'm not uh, interested in debating it at this time. I just think we're moving too quickly, and I think we should not try the high school scene next year. I think we should wait a while. And, that, and that's basically your motion, correct? Exactly. It's, all right. Um, at this time, I, I, I'm going to, it's been mo uh, moved and seconded, and I'll ask Ms. Decker to call the roll. I'm going to vote yes to support Mike Collins, which does not mean I'm against technology, and that I would suggest that for the high schools we create a bring your own device policy. I support your vote. I'm going to vote yes to support Mike Collins, but more importantly, <laughs> because I think it's good policy. Ms. Eaton? No. Mr. Gillis? No. Ms. Johnson? No. Mr. McDaniels? No. Ms. Miller? Yes, I believe that it is a matter of correct priority. Mr. Birch? Yes. Ms. Williams? No. So, this is. <laughs> The motion does not pass. Thank you. I have another motion to make. <coughs> uh, okay. I, I mean, is it my turn? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I make a motion, George, that you find a way to create another position, another board position. I want to create a position of an additional person in the senior executive assistance office. That's Debbie Decker's office of one, that that office become an office of two. The intention of the motion is that that person would be an assistant to uh, Mrs. Decker, not, uh, not a co-equal executive assistant. I don't care what title we give <laughs> him or her. But I think that uh, just as I think that the auditor's office is overwhelmed, I think frequently Debbie is overwhelmed. And, um, and I believe that the senior executive assistant to the board should be uh, inhabited by employees that work for the board. I would and second that. <laughs> because, I will stop now. <laughs> uh, I also, uh, surprisingly, do support the board's need to get information. Uh, I have some serious concerns if going through internal audit is the right way to do that. So I support Mr. Collins' uh, motion to create this uh, support for Ms. Decker to enable the board to do some research and have the ability to direct someone outside of the superintendent's staff. Um, so uh, it's been moved and second. Is there any question or comment? I, I do want to comment. I absolutely think that is um, a critical need for the reason that you also stated, Mr. McDaniels. I really do not believe that going through the audit um, department is an appropriate um, vehicle by which this board should be obtaining just information. I mean, the whole function of an auditing committee, to me, is, is a, it's, a whole, it's a different scope than just asking for routine information. We ought to be able, as a board, obtain that information without it rising to the level of having to bring an auditor in to obtain 
information. And so for that reason also, um, in addition to the hard work that Debbie, hard and good work that Debbie Decker does. Mr. Gillis. I'm, I'm not certain, I, I'm, I'm, I am certain of this, that an ad hoc board discussion on budget is not the time to raise um, issues about uh, appointments or new positions uh, and it should be a deliberative process and one of the entire budget process, not on the day before we vote on things. Um, and I think that although uh, it may be that, that, our, um, that our work as a board requires more than one support staff, this isn't the time for us to discuss and decide something that has a monetary impact. Uh, we should do it deliberatively. Whether it's a dollar or a hundred dollars, it really doesn't matter. The real, the real discussion that we should have is the process of it, and this isn't the correct process. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I welcome Brother uh, Gillis's comments. Um, I think the train respectfully has left the station. Um, two things. I recall voting on 31 contracts that total well in excess of a position for the board. And as I say, the train left the station. Um, I would be in, I'm in support of an additional position for uh, the board. And I'll tell you, it's pretty apparent that the board had bound its own hands. And where I'm going with this is the board needs to put in place its own infrastructure. So there is more policy work to do. I agree with the chair of the policy uh, review committee uh, that there is additional work to be done because we have to remove the structural impediments to the effectiveness of this board, a board created by the General Assembly, to do certain tasks pursuant to an oath that the board members took. I'll be supporting um, Mr. Collins' motion. Ms. Causey. I'll be quicker than him. Uh, I, I'm going to support this motion. Um, I think Ms. Decker does very diligent work. And again, it's the issue of the system has grown, the students have grown. We reach out to our communities, for which I commend Dr. Dance for doing so much of that. And now our community reaches back to us, which is fabulous, because everyone knows that you know that's what we want them to do. And that does create more work in that office, so I'll be supporting that. Just very, very quickly, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Ed, you know, you, you're correct in what you said, except we don't do that, as Steve said. When, when Dr. Dance, when Dallas first came, our first, uh, our first uh, meeting, and he, he even asked us to have it quickly because he wanted us to have, um, have our first uh, retreat very quickly, and Doug Eady came. And Doug, Doug Eady writes in a lot of professional journals, and, and Michelle will remember this in particular because she was in several groups with me. It was loads of fun. We got to know, I got to know the staff folks uh, really well. We did a lot, of, um, a lot of brainstorming, and it was, it was really a great meeting. But the thing Doug Eady said to us as a board, which was our very most important thing, was to work long, hard, and diligently on the budget. We don't do that. We, we don't have a mechanism to do it, and we don't do that. George and Dallas and the folks sitting at the table whose names I must confess I don't know and I apologize, and all the folks that work with you, to, com to prepare this and to know, know it the way you all know it is, is, is amazing. And, and you're worth every penny that is in here to pay you. <laughs> but, uh, but the fact of the matter is the board doesn't know a damn thing about the budget. And this is the only opportunity at this meeting where we discuss the budget, where we have an opportunity for real input. Yes, we have the two-on-twos, which are lovely, but they're not really very substantive and very meaningful, and they don't result in a vote by the board. I think it's a good effort. I'm glad Dallas has instituted the two-by-twos on a lot of different subjects. But th this is the only time we have, have to make these kinds of proposals. This is an infinitesimal amount of money. And while philosophically I agree with Ed Gillis that, yes, we should be hand in glove day by day working on the board, but then again, we'd all have to be full-time volunteers that come up here several days a week. And while uh, a few of the members work that hard uh, already by all of the things that they attend, and, uh, and I'm speaking, uh, you know who I'm speaking of, I won't mention any particular names. Some of the rest of us um, work very hard too, but we also have full-time jobs and other, and other obligations that give us less time to spend on board business. But we're all diligent about what we're doing. 
but this is the only chance we have to have any impact. So, so while I think you're right, I think that uh, you should vote for my motion anyway. <laughs> Okay. I it's, call the vote. All right, we have the motion. It's been seconded. Uh, Ms. Decker, would you call the roll again, please? Ms. Cosby? Yes. Mr. Yes. Ms. Eaton? Yes. Mr. Bailey? No. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. McDaniels? Yes. Ms. Miller? Yes. Mr. Birch? Aye. Ms. Williams? Yes. <clears throat> Darn, I thought I was going to get two unanimously tonight. Only one. All right. <coughs> okay. So are, are there any further questions for our panel at this time? Uh, again, I just have one brief question, Mr. Chairman. Um, George, I noted that there's a reference made to, uh, I don't know, like $250,000 in savings or thereabouts, approximately that, due to, uh, related to like fuel and uh, sewage and such like that. Yeah, I know we're, we're, be we're becoming more energy efficient. And what I wanted you to comment on, if you could, uh, a few, I want to say a few meetings ago, I asked about uh, the natural, one of the natural gas contracts. And uh, there's an index that relates to natural gas as a commodity. Mm -hmm. And those of us that uh, fill up our own gas tanks know that, you know, some fuel prices are going down, and they're going down significantly. Uh, I wanted to know if you might be able to uh, speak to what, if any, savings are anticipated this year recognizing that energy costs can change, but given what's being, we're being told, what if any uh, savings are being realized in the current budget uh, as part of the consortium that I understand we participate in, uh, according to Mr. Smith, uh, with other school uh, jurisdictions? Right. Uh, Baltimore County Public Schools is a member of the Baltimore Regional Cooperative Purchasing Council, which is sort of like uh, the Metropolitan Council of Governments in Washington, and it's uh, they cooperate on on purchases of utilities and fuel, and uh, the council made a decision, and we are a member and uh, participate in the contracts that they establish. So last year, at some point, whenever they locked in the price for this year, it really did not uh, capitalize on the very rapid uh, reduction in energy prices that we've seen in the last six or eight months. So we really will not be um, saving as much this year as we had projected. But um, nonetheless, we're we still believe that that budget adjusted for the 250000 in heating oil for FY17 should be more than adequate. So I don't expect any big savings in 16. Okay, George. That, was that the Yeah, they, that, that, that'll yeah. work, George. Yeah, All thanks. Right. Okay, again, I, I would also like to thank our panel, Mr. Saris, Mr. Tantliff, and Ms. Wynn for your preparation and uh, information. Uh, and Ms. Causey uh, seems to have a comment too. Um, two quick things. One, when you were talking about consolidating the offices and there's a $4 million shift going back to page. Um, Are you in the budget with Ms. Causey? Yes, in the budget. I believe it was a superintendent page. Ms. Miller, you may help me out. Um, I'm sorry the $4 million one-time technology that was oh, in the admin office? Right, right. Yes, but what, what was that $4 million in technology? Um, so if, if we want to, let's see here, maybe to tie in with this briefer document that we've got here. If you look at the bottom of page four, um, you'll see the one-time requests and I believe it, the biggest portion of the 4.4 is the $3.15 million, and then I believe um, the remaining items are the uh, fiber optic cabling, the enterprise backup, and the server additions. Thank you. That's the bulk of it. And then uh, for the um, parent advocate that was here related to the communication devices, <coughs> Do we currently provide 
those communication we, devices? We do. If so, what is the budget for that? What is it? Um, and Verlita can expand on what I what I'm aware of, but for the last nine years that I've been here, we've been buying reader devices and communication devices. What I don't know for sure is that we do it at the infant and toddler level, uh, and so. Um, there's there's never been a restriction on the devices that th for a student based on need so i'm just not clear if it's a programmatic distinction or philosophy but um really i have purchased dozens of these things signed off on uh requisitions for those. So. Mr. Saris is exactly right. So it comes through our budget through assistive technology um, that we provide to schools. And then um, what you saw in the stat budget also is communication devices for our special schools as well uh, for students with communication needs. So what, what is roughly the total dollar volume for a year? I don't know. I would have to, to get that total dollar To look it up, but we can get you that number. Um, Now, you're, are you talking about specifically a like a speech communicator rather than a reader or some other? Because we purchased lots of assistive devices, but that specific item? Yes, and the total assistive, okay. whether it's readers or... Right, so that total will also come from various budgets as well it's in terms of um, special education, some from DOIT, some from assistive technology. Again, it, it's based on a student's IEP. So if it's in a student's IEP, we are required um, by law to provide the service to the student. Thank you. And I know we've uh, had a lot of discussion around this, and I've heard a lot of the concerns, and I, and, and I just feel that it's really um, concerning about moving forward, expanding so quickly. And Ed, I understand, Mr. Gillis, what you're saying about having those discussions here. And I, and I um, agree that it would be helpful to have more discussions with uh, the immediate folks, but I would just like to make a motion to pull back five million from the stat rollout and have meetings to discuss how that's done. The high schools could still get theirs, um, but the, the amount of money that's going without the research, taking away the opportunity to have a control group, and when people are doing incredible experiments and research, which this is, it is important to have a con control group to understand because so many things are changing at once, the curriculum, the, uh, the common core standards, the, the testing, and also this initiative that it's going to be very hard to parse out what is in fact helpful, what's been challenging, and so forth. So that's a new motion that's out there um, and to meet with the superintendent and the staff and to figure out um, how we can best do that to number one, make sure that we are not expanding this too quickly and that we um, still have a way to do uh, research and understand the impact of all of these changes. A second the motion. There's a mo I think we've discussed this general issue. Uh, there's a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call, please? I, have a, I just have one question. Uh, just a uh, couple of questions for George. George, um, the budget last year, um, I know that, you know, it was prepared very diligently. It was, of course, reviewed by the folks up in, uh, you know, in courthouse and as the money is being spent we have the office of the auditor we have the administrators that are monitoring that at the end of the year for the 2015 budget what if any funds were returned to county government well um, it something on the order of five million dollars or so what funds that are not expended uh, go into our fund balance and so the fund balance on june 30th was about 48 million dollars and then on july 1 we used you know the 19 comes out and so at that point it was about 28 million dollars but we it, it's returned to the county government in the sense that we cannot appropriate it ourselves it comes back to us in the appropriation that the county government gives us in May, so. 
So it's just money that mm -hmm. then that wasn't spent during the designated fiscal year that then is returned for expenditure for the following fiscal year. It's returned to county government. Some some school systems retain those dollars. We're not one of them. They they go back to the county and then can be reappropriated. Right, but they're fungible. I mean, they kind of like mix and mingle, and it could be the same dollar well, bill. No, they're on our financial statement, so they're definitely linked to Baltimore County schools. Miss mm -hmm. Causey, is there a reason you chose five million dollars? I, I believe that it's an amount of money in which we can uh, limit it, but obviously the board's uh, wishes were to keep the high schools, so I didn't want to take too much that it would take away from the opportunity to do the high schools, but also it would allow uh, for the students that currently have devices to get those in the next grade so that there's they have a continuum of usage of the technology, but that it's not expanded the other way to schools where students don't have them right up next to them. So that's that's why I picked it. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Decker. Okay. Ms. Crosby? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Ms. Eaton? No. Mr. Gillis? No. Ms. Johnson? No. Mr. McDaniel? No. Ms. Miller? Yes. Mr. Birch? No. Ms. Williams? No. Okay, the motion does not pass. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> all right, I think that's all we have for our panel this evening. Thank you again very much. <coughs> and thank you, board, for your thank participation you. and input. All right. Okay, our next item on the agenda is board member comments. And uh, I'm going to start with Mr. Virch this evening. Uh, We'll go around from the, the right. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, you know, when you're in trial, they tell you there's two things to keep in mind, primacy and recency. Primacy is the first person to speak. Recency is the last person to speak. As the first person, I've spoken enough. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Uh, Ms. Miller. Yes, I would like to thank all of those who came out for the um, public input hearing and all of those who have been giving input either in person, by phone, by email. Um, and I, I wanted to say that so often people will, uh, you know, address a concern that they have and ask, can we bring it up for discussion? And the answer that I would like to give them is probably not. And I want to give my reason for saying that. Um, the, the reason is that the board, through its policies, has either willingly or, unwit or unwittingly um, given away some of its authority, either to the superintendent or to others in the system. Um, and I'm going to give an example, and that is policy 8314, and I give that as an example, one of many. Uh, but it is coming up for review probably uh, in the next meeting or two. Uh, most boards use Robert's Rules of Order to govern their proceedings, and we do as well. But Policy 8314 over, overrules Robert's Rules, and basically it says that uh, in order to bring an item up for discussion, the superintendent and the chairman set the agenda. And then to change the agenda, if you request something that doesn't get on, you have to have a unanimous vote of the board to change the agenda. Unanimous. That's just to have a discussion. That's not to vote on a motion. That's just to have a discussion. Um, that is in no way representative of good parliamentary order. And I would like to encourage the public to become familiar with our policies. That is how the board directs the school system. Our policies are right up there, the most important things that we do, along with passing a budget and hiring a superintendent. 
And I want to especially thank Dr. Ferrone for coming out. He's the only one that regularly, or usually ever, comes out to speak on our policies. So please read them. Please give us input. Um, if you're not sure how to get it on our website, just in the search box, just type in the word policy and they'll come up. So I encourage you all to be aware of that and, and also see how it affects the functioning of our board. Thank you. Ms. Johnson? Um, yep, we had a curriculum committee meeting this, pa this week or last week and one of the things we talked about was the career and technology education. And I've been saying college or career ready. And with the CTE program in Baltimore County Schools, and Doug Handy just left, I think that he mentioned that either half of high school students or over half of high school, I don't know which one it was, are enrolled in CTE programs. And um, I didn't know a lot about them until this curriculum past meeting. But it was really enlightening and informative and um, pretty amazing um, <laughs> to see that business management and finance are, are, are at some schools that uh, homeland security and emergency preparedness that you can walk away with um, you may have college credit you can walk away with a, a certificate in CCNA you can sit for the praxis some pretty amazing things that we're doing here in Baltimore County so I look um, anyone who is also while you're on the BCPS website look up CTE and see the things that we're doing with it <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Collins. Every sentence ends with a period. Period. Thank you. Ms. Waya. I would just like to thank uh, Mr. Hayden on behalf of Nick and I for giving us a time to talk to the counselors today. It was great to kind of communicate with our counselors and get to know and to also be able to explain the new small election process to them because they'll be an asset for us as we move forward this year with that process. So I just want to thank Mr. Hayden for that. Thanks. Thank you. I'm with Mr. Collins. Yeah, period. It's once tonight. Period. Okay. Ms. Cosby. Um, first, I wanted to, to thank all the wonderful people in Baltimore County. Um, we do have a great county and we do have a great school system. Um, and uh, I do feel that it is the role of the board to look at everything carefully and to really try and set forth uh, good decisions, using good policy and making good decisions. So as I uh, examine things and, and uh, sometimes dissect things, that does not take away from the wonderful things that I do know are happening in the school system. And I wanna thank the, uh, our, our, our county government, our county council and our county executive who do fund us. Uh, the, we have not gone below maintenance of effort. In fact, as the budget folks pointed out, we've gone up here and there, and the one-time asks have been very, very helpful um, to the system for initiatives that we're doing. Um, I also <coughs> wanted to thank Ann for her careful um, analysis of the budget, and I think that if we next year start that about three months earlier, uh, this meeting will be shorter and we'll make better decisions. Um, I also wanted to thank Marisol for bringing to uh, the, the whole board and uh, the, the complete understanding that we need to take care of those kids, and I just really uh, thank you for bringing that up and remain on the policy review committee and Steve, who we've been working around this issue and, and really understanding the concerns of the, of the parents and the teachers. Um, I do have serious concerns about the rollout of STAT moving forward and I hope that we're not in a position a couple years down the road where we're wondering what to do with all of these expensive devices and these leases that we have. I am not against technology. I actually have a technology background and I believe that it's very important that our students uh, learn to use it and use it effectively and efficiently, uh, but in a manner that's, that is actually systemically, financially sustainable. And if we follow the STAT uh, in, uh, six year plan that we have, uh, it's currently not able to be funded in those outward years. So that's gonna be a discussion um, that's coming. It's gonna get harder and harder to support that as we talk about uh, other priorities that are getting pushed to the wayside. Um, we heard Randallstown High School. They're not gonna be a lighthouse school that I know of. Of course, I don't know yet, but they're, you know, they're not being cared for. We have our special ed kids, the transportations and so forth. So um, I appreciate the board members and all of our discussion and um, that's all I'll say for now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Ms. Williams? <clears throat> I know the hour is late, but I really do want to thank everyone for coming out um, for the public hearing. It was very helpful to me. 
um, and I was um, really impressed with the detailed comments and really the sincere concern expressed by the members of the public on the three topics that were um, shared for discussion. Um, I do want to continue to encourage the public to come out because we do value what you have to say and, you know, contrary to popular belief, um, I feel strongly that there is not this old board versus new board. Um, we are the board. And um, while we all have different opinions, I believe that all of us have the interest, the best interest of our kids at heart when we make decisions and when we vote on different um, matters before the board. I also encourage you to continue to look at policies. Um, and if you have concerns, to continue to bring those um, issues to our attention. Neither the chair of the PRC nor any individual member creates or makes policies. Policies are decided by this entire board. And if uh, there are policies that the public would like to see amended or changed or deleted, then it is your responsibility as a member of the public to come and to present those views and concerns uh, to the board. But again, thank you all um, for your participation and um, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of this team. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Ms. Eaton, you get to wrap us up. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mr. We Chair, I'm sorry. As I was sitting here listening to uh, Ms. Williams and looking at my notes, I did forget to, to thank our legislators who are currently down in Annapolis who also support us uh, and the governor and uh, our comptroller who is also uh, very concerned and works with us on our construction. So thank you to all of them. And, and on that note, I want to make it clear. I am completely supportive of all of our schools being air conditioned. What I don't want to see happen is this political football with the dollars, um, you know, being bounced back and forth to the detriment ultimately of all of the schools getting air conditioned. So I just want to go on record. Chairman, if I could have, if I could have recency, just to say, <laughs> well done, Hawthorne Elementary School. They got a $10,000, they received a $10,000 grant from Verizon. I don't know if they're part of the establishment Mr. Collins was referring to, but it will go for STEM. The kids are really excited about it. And they picked up a $2,000 grant for a 3D printer. And that's our Hawthorne Elementary School in our 6th district. All right, thank you. At, all right. For information, uh, there's a financial report available uh, in board docs and for your information, our next board meeting will be Tuesday, February 2nd at 7 p.m. here at the Greenwood Building. And with that, uh, with no further action, our meeting's adjourned. <laughs>